<laughs> All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome um, to the October 21st, 2021 Indiana Recycling Mark Board meeting. And thank you all for attending. And it's pretty much a packed day with a number of very good grants requests. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Gianna Gardner because we do have some members attending remotely. Yes, good afternoon. I get to read the uh, Zoom script for, for us this morning. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today, Deanna Garner. And I'm just going to take a moment. Does someone have Zoom their microphone on? Because there does seem to be an echo. Oh. Maybe it, it's a new, we're doing using a new system here. So <laughs> there may be some technical difficulties. The owl, yeah. it's yeah. the owl, yeah. the owl TV. <laughs> um, all microphones are currently muted. <laughs> For attendance tracking, please take a moment to write your name and affiliation in the chat box if you're attending via Zoom. We will be taking questions and comments from the public at today's meeting. All participants will be able to unmute themselves and ask questions or make comments at the appropriate times. If you have a question or technical issue during the presentation, please use the raise hand or chat feature. To access the raise hand and chat feature at the bottom or top of your screen, depending on your device, you'll see a menu bar. You may have to move your mouse or touch your screen for the menu bar to pop up. In the middle of that menu, there is a chat icon in which you can click on to show that chat dialog. You should also see the raise hand option. This also can be seen under the participant list, which is also another icon. Please utilize the raise hand for chat features if you have any questions or comments. You'll be called upon at the appropriate time. For those on the phone, if you have a question or comment, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine, and we will call on you at the appropriate time. When called upon, you'll need to unmute un your phone by pressing star six. For everyone present via Zoom in today's meeting, please identify yourself when speaking. If any members of the media have joined us, please utilize the chat feature or email media at inem.in.gov if you have any questions or would like to schedule an interview. This meeting is being recorded and will be posted on IDEM's website at recycle.in.gov. And with that, I'll turn the meeting over to our board chair, Bruce Burrow, who'll be leading today's meeting. All right, thank you again, and thank you, Deanna. Um, second item on the agenda is consideration and approval of the August 5th, 2021 RMDB board meeting summary. Has anyone, everyone had the opportunity to review the transcripts of the meeting? Questions, comments, corrections? Hearing none, can I have a motion to approve? Second. Motion by Mr. Weaver, second. Second. Second by Mr. Lutz. Any other discussion? Um, let's do a roll call vote because we do have some remarks. Please. I can I can do it. And uh, Ms. Whitehead? Aye. Mr. Lux? Aye. Ms. Hackner? Aye. And, uh, and Mr. Noonan? Aye. And Mr. Garam? Aye. Ms. Weger? Aye. And myself? Aye. With that, the motion carries. That's the I'm sorry, Terry <laughs> Wesley. Henry, Ms. Henry? Aye. Sorry about that. Thank you. Now she carries it in this way. And second item on the agenda is the status of the existing grants uh, by Ms. Gardner. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I skipped over the item update. Uh, Julia Wicker, Assistant Commissioner, Office of Program Support and Agricultural Liaison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it's Julia, but thank you for um, that. I'll make sure and tell my husband. So um, it's great for us to all be here in person. The last time we were in this room was right at the cusp of COVID, I think. And uh, 
um, it's really nice to be able to see everyone. So um, I do want to start by letting you know that this is the National Earthquake Shakeout Day, October 21st at 10.21 a.m. across the country um, that is happening. I'm not sure what the procedure is here in um, the Shadeland office. I don't know if there'll be an announcement. I'm not sure, but there may be a disruption at 10.21 a.m. And I just wanted everyone to know about that. So um, it, it's really precaution. Um, I also mentioned the OWL. Um, this is a new tool that we are using at IDEM to help us with hybrid meetings like we're having today. Um, as you can see, those eyes are staring right at you. <laughs> and if you speak, usually the eyes will stare across the table. Um, really to, to, you know, if you want to communicate with those on the screen, really look at the owl. Um, so, because if you look up there, it's gonna look like you're looking away. So it's a really bad habit I have. I'm doing it right now. I'm looking up there and I should be looking here, but um, it's a really effective tool to help us um, communicate with our stakeholders and customers across the state and country. Um, we've um, implement, we're implementing these in our regional offices as well. And so uh, it's a really, a really good tool of communication. Um, our, uh, we're really excited about, um, we just closed our community recycling grant program <coughs> application process on October 15th. Um, I don't have all of the specifics, but I can tell you that we had unprecedented numbers of applicants. And we're really excited about reviewing those internally and um, figuring and determining where that $500,000 uh, will go to communities, schools, and stakeholder groups across the state. So uh, excited about that. And we'll have a report for you um, at the next meeting. We also are in the process of uh, hiring and completing the hiring of a general recycling manager position that was vacated when Allison Taylor left us earlier this summer. So we were very close to making that announcement and excited um, that we'll be able to fill that position as it's key to a lot of the work that we do uh, both inside and outside of state government on recycling. We are working pretty aggressively, um, working on our National Recycling Day events. Uh, National Recycling Day is November 15th. And so we are doing a uh, plastic bag recycling drive um, in the state government complex. Um, our regional offices are participating as well, but for the, uh, for the, uh, we're, we're asking for, uh, and Kristen may talk about this. Kristen's going to probably talk more about this, but um, we're really excited about this initiative. So I'll let her talk about that. Um, uh, uh, November 15th also is Pat Dana's birthday, so make sure to put that on your calendar. Um, that's really important. She wants to celebrate with uh, the recyclers all across the country. Um, and uh, we're planning to do some editorials talking about the importance of recycling um, in our circular economy. So excited about uh, what November has to offer. We have participated and had a lot of activity. I'm sure you'll hear about it today. Um, on the recycling study that you commissioned um, a year and a half ago. Uh, a lot of work has been done on that. A lot of news media outlets have picked up um, the, uh, the study and have really focused on the recommendations. But we're really excited to sit down with you um, at your January meeting and really vision and plan for how we plan to uh, utilize some of the information in that study to plan our account, to plan our grants moving forward, but I, I wanted you to know there's a, been a lot of activity. I'm sure Deanna will talk about that as well. Uh, we are working um, in our central office on several uh, legislative reports that'll be um, due to Representative, Representative Shibley and her counterparts that are on the screen. I see uh, Representative Arrington on the screen. I think Senator Yoder has joined as well. So those legislative reports are mandated annually and we will also make those um, available publicly um, when they're published. Uh, we are community, for your purposes, we have a community recycling grant program report. Uh, we do an annual recycling report, an e-waste report, and of course the work that comes out of the Recycling Market Development Board. So um, that's, that's kind of all hands on deck right now, getting ready for that November 1st deadline. Um, we are hearing uh, that there is the potential of some legislation in the Indiana General Assembly on recycling. Uh, we have not been um, specifically involved with any of that, but 
talking to a lot of the stakeholder groups, our partners, um, there seems to be some work being done in that front. So I guess we'll wait and see. I, I would never uh, Representative Shively predict the legislature, um, but uh, we, we potentially may have something on recycling um, coming down the pike. And then, as I stated earlier, I'm really excited as we move into early 2022, uh, working with you on kind of a strategic planning exercise. I think we're going to talk a little bit about what that might look like um, a little bit later, but I'm excited to be able to work with you on, on all these initiatives. So with that, does anyone have any questions for me or any thoughts? Um, the Community Recycling Grant Program. Uh, there were, and maybe it's just me, but I, I, I saw two or three grant applications this time around that I felt more appropriately should have been applied to that community grant program. Uh, did we try to steer uh, applicants one way or the other? Because I, I think a couple of these would have stood up in a chance. Good point. Uh, We've talked about that. That internally, maybe Pat Daniel. Um, usually, if, if, if an application comes in that we think would fare better under the community recycling grant program, we do mention that. However, we we don't um, encourage anyone not to submit an application. Some of those that may apply to this program for the RBE grants may be ones that are above the limits for the CRGP because it's a much smaller amount. Thank you. Any other questions for me? Thank you, Terry. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Julia. Very important question we have here, though. Um, Pat, do you prefer chocolate, vanilla, strawberry cake? <laughs> <laughs> uh, strawberry. <laughs> Since you asked, right? <laughs> we'll, make, we'll make note of that. Thank you. All right. Um, the next item on the agenda is Ms. Farner with the status update of existing grants. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I'm going to keep it short and brief since we have a busy agenda today. Uh, we had, uh, as of the last meeting, two um, fiscal year 20 grants open. CW uh, Recycling was a C&D waste uh, grant that we funded, and that one has closed now. I have a site visit scheduled for them next week to see the, the piece of equipment. So I guess it's closing, I should say. <laughs> um, and then Growing Green is, is the um, MRF facility that they are building in um, Moores, or not Mooresville, Martinsville area. Um, they uh, are providing updates every other month for us on that progress and um, had plans as of the last update to be purchasing the equipment um, this month. Um, so hopefully the next update, which should be shortly, um, will say that that's been purchased. Um, so they're moving forward on that. That expires in March. Fiscal year 21, there's been no issues with the grants. They're all progressing nicely. Um, and they plan to, um, uh, all those expire between January and March. So that'll be um, a busy time to close those. And um, I can provide any answers if you have any questions. The recycling grant application out of Anderson for recycled asphalt, what's they indicated they might not be able to complete the project. What's the current right. status of that? Yeah, as mentioned at the last meeting, they're they're um, keeping the equipment and, and hoping to give it around this this um, winter. That's you know kind of their busier season. Um, and, and, and make sure, see if it works and, and have it work again with Anderson and try to get that um, contract back. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, the next item on the agenda recycling program reports, uh, recycling activity summary by Mr. Weiss. So yeah, this is our recycling uh, report for, uh, we call it the index report because it looks more at the, the progress as we try to achieve the 50% recycling goals. We gotta measure that, how we get there. So 
there's many elements that go in to making that uh, determination. And so we're talking activity reports, which we collect through our online reporting system, Retrack, is a, a big part of that effort. And but the name change kind of reflects the, the the overall efforts. And later on, we'll talk more specifically about recycling activity uh, summaries. Um, so the first slide, yes, we have the solid waste metrics. Oh, on the next slide. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, this gives the boundaries of uh, as a measurement. And we see our recycling rate uh, for 2020 was 19.1%. And, and, and the bottom line is the generation rate uh, of municipal solid waste. And so, of course, you know, our uh, boundary is municipal solid waste. So 19.1% is the recycling rate. And you see the uh, generation is, is pretty even. And uh, the recycling rate is off relatively uh, even as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, I won't back that up, but um, yeah, the sectors are, are important as it goes into that. Um, sorry. <laughs> Technical difficulties, it just crashed. And um, yeah, so the sectors are the residential sector, uh, the, the industrial, commercial, institutional sectors also make up the municipal solid waste. In our generation, there it is. It changes the default speaker when, uh, when I open the PowerPoint. So, this little technology. <laughs> so, the solid waste and recycling infrastructure of the whole there is about 8.9 million tons. And most of that is landfilling, uh, 6 million tons. These are. Uh, reports that we get that we track these tonnages. And so the index is specifically these categories. And then there, there's other things that I suppose you, you could throw in there, but this is the categories that we track over the years, you know, five years that we've tracked this information. So, so it's pretty reliable from uh, that standpoint. And so, so you can see landfills is a big element of that in it. And waste energy also, is shown there energy from waste, and you know, we have some uh, MSW that goes out of state. And then the recycling components are our recycling activity reports that we get, and then composting and e waste re uh, recycling, which uh, Kristen will talk about next. Um, just to <clears throat> get a feel for recyclables that originate. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, Tom. And on the last slide, you had the exports listed. Are we pretty much at a balance with imports and exports, or do we import more solid waste than we export? Well, uh, yeah, we we also track what imports come into the state. And roughly, what is shown here is is all from in-state origins. And um, imports uh, of disposal account for uh, about 30 okay. percent and, and again what is shown here is from in-state origins I see. thank you so, so we do have a a good amount of imports of, of waste that comes to the state and as we look at the data especially for recyclables we, we get a feel for where they originate from and it's a surprisingly only 20% of the recyclables that are shown would come from single stream collection uh, based on the data that, that we see. And then 45% um, of the recyclables would come from source separated type operations, uh, mainly from uh, industrial, institutional, commercial sectors. And these are packaging uh, like cardboard and, and those type of recyclables that come from uh, the industrial, uh, commercial, and institutional sectors. And then 35% would come from wood waste uh, uh, that we uh, are, are seeing. Uh, 
and organic it's wood waste and organic but anyway this this kind of is a final look as to where our uh efforts go and it, it's a it shows a magnitude of change as we can see if you want to go towards recycling or diversion or, or even a super economy type things it, you know, we have a, a big area to work from and all these efforts are are very worthy so we need landfills we, we need energy from waste and, and definitely need recycling to go into that circular economy so a lot of opportunities uh, there and the next slide and here you, you get a feel for the 145 reports that we get that we track uh, on an annual basis and um, yeah, the, the first category is cell waste management. And these principal business activities are completed by the, the, the registration uh, facility. They indicate where they fall in line with that business activity. And so this is, uh, uh, the reports are broken out by what they would indicate who they are. And the cell waste management companies would be, uh, um, oh, the transfer station, could be landfills, uh, as well as the waste energy facility would be in that category. And it's always management districts and government again. Uh, yeah, this year we had 63 out of 76 districts submit reports. And all of them are, except one district, are registered in retract. But we do get uh, good reports from always management districts. Uh, and then government would be uh, places like Richmond or Jasper or even the Allen County uh, submits under the government uh, category. Now, businesses. Um, some mature recovery facilities uh, consider themselves to be a business, and the business category also includes. Uh, we, we have some big box retailers in their reports this year, uh, like Walmart, uh, Target, Kroger, uh, Giant Eagle, and Home Depot. So, so they fall under that category, and, and it's non non for profits as well. Um, and these other categories uh, are. Um, Areas that um, type of facilities that, that we can um, focus upon. So it gives you an idea of where the report's coming from. Um, yeah, next slide. And you, you've seen this one before. This is how we uh, avoid double counting uh, of, of the tonnage. And mainly by um, measuring the, the, the bottom three categories. Um, that's where um, the recycling management comes from, those tonnages. And the first category is, is um, a way to track local efforts. And some companies will indicate that they send their recyclables to another recycling facility, which also reports mm -hmm. in those bottom three categories. Uh, so that's the purpose of that slide. And the next slide, you'll see the tonnages involved that. Uh, we got for 2020, and it, I guess generally, generally the, the, the tonnages we we talk about infrastructure types of, that will contribute to those amounts, and so the, the material recovery facility, the MRF sheds, uh, are an important part of, of the reporting, and we get very good uh, reports from uh, facilities that would be in the MRF shed. And so each MRF shed, you know, is specific to a material recovery facility. And we uh, oh, um, have 14 material recovery facilities in the state that, um, that do report. So there is a, also a direct hauls, which, um, may be outside of that merge shed. And, and so those are some of the numbers that, that we may or may not get because um, they're usually generators and they will directly send their recyclables to an end use and, and will not go through a merge shed. And so we do get good reporting from the merge shed, but sometimes we don't always get good reporting from generators who um, again, again send their recyclables directly to the end use. Uh, metal salvage yards is another category uh, that um, are not required to do some reports. 
and they do not go through a merge shed either. Uh, so just kind of a highlight on the infrastructure there. Yeah, next slide. You, you, again, you get to see over the years, uh, <coughs> fiber or cardboard, paper, it, it's all the same under, under paper, uh, is the majority of the recyclables being shipped there. And yeah, next slide. Uh, market destinations. Obviously, we got robust regional markets outside of the state. And this is a category of reporting where um, would be in addition to recycling activity summaries, if we were to get better information about what is being used in state, how many tons of recyclables are being used in state. Uh, this is where those categories would show up. Um, so manufacturers and end users are not required to submit reports, and we don't want their information mixed with the recycling activity summaries uh, to avoid double counting. So, so if we look at manufacturers and end users, we would have to, to treat them in a separate category of how many tons uh, of recyclables that they would use. And, and right now, our end state uh, facilities have a, a demand uh, much greater than what our supply what it would be. And that could, that could be a strategy area down the road to look at closer. And the next next slide gives an idea about our single stream uh, recycling collection. We've tracked um, seven material recovery facilities uh, specifically with single stream collection. And these same seven facilities uh, are reported there uh, and well, in the red, you see the tonnages that uh, were shipped from those facilities. And also there's some single stream uh, collection at transfer stations that go out of state to emerge. And, and so what we're trying to do here is to get a feel for how many tons that are being collected through single stream curbside collection programs mainly. And this gives you an indication like uh, 300, well, 300,000 tons approximately is what that capacity would be. And if you, if you do some basic math, whereas recyclables from a curbside container, uh, estimates would be 500 pounds per year per household for uh, a recycling container. And assuming 300,000 tons total collection uh, would translate to 1.2 million households uh, with. Uh, curbside containers. And then he, so our households in Indiana uh, would have uh, 2.7, 2.8 million households in the state. So it gives you an idea about um, single stream collection capacity. Um, as we look at 50% recycling goal, uh, this is one element of it. And you know, we're at this level and we probably need to, to increase that, uh, probably triple that at least. That's uh, what I have today. And sure, Bruce. I hate to put you on the spot again, Tom. Um, but I would be very interested in the consumption of recycled commodities within the state, if we can pull that number together. I, I don't know if that's possible uh, because I, I'm always looking at the supply and demand yeah. within the state of Indiana. And we're blessed with a lot of companies that utilize recycled commodities for their products. And I think it would give us a little bit more insight as a board as to the impetus we need to do our job a little better and maybe a little stronger. And uh, maybe we can get Ms. Shively to up our ante here a bit <laughs> with regard to funds available for programs. Yeah, no, that is an excellent point, and, and that's an important piece of information that we want to get to as well. Uh, being able to list the, the, the core uh, manufacturers that use recyclables in the state, how many tons they're using, and what percent comes from in Indiana. That's still a number that we want to get to. I have a question along the same line. You had a slide that, that indicated that. The amount of materials being utilized in the state, right, and the amount of materials that were being exported, right, and you made the comment that uh, 
we could use more in state. And if we could, then why is some of this stuff going out of state? Is it the last lack of infrastructure? And, and that is, yeah, as reported by a facility spent splitting the reports where they send their, their materials. Um, yeah, the markets are, are regional. I mean, they're, they're just as good as across the border as they are in, in Indiana. And um, that sometimes they go through brokers. Sometimes their companies will directly send their uh, materials to those end-use markets. Yeah, I don't know. I don't don't know if, how all that fits together. If infrastructure is an issue, or or relationships that uh, companies have with their customers. If I may help, Tom. Yeah, a lot of it, Terry, has to do with transportation costs and the contracts that the companies hold with those um, out-of-state uh, consumers. And when you consider international paper, you know, we have, you know, we have paper plants in Valparaiso, but IP may pull a lot of material out of the southern sector of Indiana just because of transportation costs. Tom, real quick. Um, first, thank you very much. Great, great slides and, and, and great presentation. I appreciate that. A um, few comments. The, the slide that we talked about that had the breakdown of the reporting of who reported sure. businesses, industry, manufacturing, uh, recycling centers, MERS, things of that nature. The, and and it, it kind of goes into, you know, the data is only good as what the, what's gets collected in, right? Right. Um, the, and then you, and, and it's always a balance of solid waste. So, I mean, I, I always continue, the tough part about balancing to get to that, that magic number of 50% of what is 50% is, um, you know, the volume base, the weight based program. And I always say is, you know, recycling is behind the eight ball, so to speak. When you look at it on a weight based sector, we mentioned that um, for a resident to drop 500 pounds, it can, can be recycled in, a, in an annual basis um, in a, you know, 96 gallon cart. Well, take that same 96 gallon cart and put solid waste in there, well, what does that number it's substantially higher? So you're all, you're already kind of, kind of behind the eight ball there, right? If you're looking at yeah. it on a, oh, on yeah. a weight-based analysis. But then to this piece is, I'm just curious to know is where, um, looking at these numbers and, you know, 22 businesses that, that reported, no, there's a lot more than 22 businesses in the state of Indiana. So what, area do you would you project to say is that we could get better with or encourage to do more reporting and getting um, more uh, of the recycling data to kind of really get a true balance of where we're at where is the state at right is what yeah it, well yeah the Merck, the Merck shed as I talked about mm -hmm. is represented uh, by a few few companies which move a majority of the recyclables. Correct, yes. And okay. I think probably, I would guess that the solid waste management companies, the solid waste districts, the governments. Right. I, you, we're, I, I would optimistically say we're over 50%, maybe into under, you know, quite a bit that we've captured a lot of those, but. Um, so, so there's a, a, a shipments of recyclables outside of the merge ship. Yeah, right. Exactly. They go direct. Right. You were talking about the direct. And those numbers that we're not getting. Yeah. And, and they could be much greater. Um, so our recycling rate is 19.1, but in reality, it is probably could be. maybe 25, 30%. So with that being said, and I know that you mentioned is we do the, the worry about double counting. Right. Is when we talk to, you know, the end users or, or the mills, um, you know, the Valparaisos, the, yep. you know, that the end. If we were to, I just, I'd be curious, um, and because we don't want to double count, but I'd be curious to know what that number is, is if we were to go and survey the end users, the mills, right, and say, how much material of inbound material or shipment do they receive, Sure. and see what that number, that total number looks like, and it would be interesting to see if, you know, if they could even report of, you know, in-state numbers because I, I would venture to say that might capture a lot of those um you know 
uh, the single stream or the you know the 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 single source material like a you know bales of cardboard or bales of paper yeah. that are shipped directly that may not come from the merch check that might not come but 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 take that number away take, yeah. add that all total yeah. into and have a separate total and say here's that total based on the solid waste and maybe we might get to you know I'd, I'd be interested to see what that percentage looks like and that would give us a, 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 another piece of information that would um you would compare that to the yeah. 19 percent of what what what, what the supply would. side would do yeah and, and we know you know the, the pratt mill and valparaiso i mean they'll say that that uses uses 500,000 tons of cardboard uh fiber coming in that facility only 25 percent comes from indiana mm -hmm. and the, so they get a lot a lot of the material from out of state for that one facility and so yeah it, now that exercise would be very, very beneficial. There are also a number of businesses that are not reporting mm -hmm. because they were not captured when the statute was passed requiring reporting. And uh, I know some of us, especially NWRA, has been talking to IDEP about going back again, hopefully in this next legislative yeah. session, and capturing some of those businesses that escaped the last time around that's where i was that that's kind of what i was trying to get to is if we were to go to the end users and the mills would you capture that data you know what i'm saying in a, in a roundabout way so i don't know if anybody's here from the irc but they just recently hosted an event where they had um representatives and and uh they had i don't know six or seven people from different industries Specifically talking about the fact that I know compensation was one of the primaries. Uh, specifically talking about the desire for more in-state recyclables, and if the infrastructure was there and they could get those coming in directly, they would absolutely be able to utilize those, and they would be able to expand their business, add jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So I know that that IRC is working with some of those those companies already, and Again, every single one of them reiterated the same thing. If we could get better collection and have an increased stream of in-state recyclables, they could absolutely use those materials. So, so Indiana is, is very good in that regard on our manufacturing side of things. Uh, we, we do have a, a robust markets. And Tom, I'd like to add, you know, we, we focused a lot on plastics and paper. And but Indiana has probably one of the largest uh, needs for glass yeah. in anybody in the Midwest. We do. And with our recycling or with our um, insulation companies and ball glass, obviously, we have a, a tremendous opportunity there. And on a weight based basis. Um, nothing is going to be heavier than glass. Than glass. <laughs> so that'll help push our numbers there as well. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks, Tom. Good job, Tom. Next on the agenda, we have the e waste recycling report by Kristen Kosas. Hopefully, I pronounced the last name correctly. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Kristen Kesters, thank you very much. German, very odd for most people. I recently did get married though, so that will be changing to Davis in the next couple months. So keep an eye out for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. No, not at all. No, we're getting rid of that one completely. Just the Davis. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, board, so much for having me today to speak to you to go over the results for the 2020 e-waste report and data. As I said, my name is Kristen Kesters, and I am the electronic waste or e-waste manager for IDEM. I took over from Jacob Schmicker earlier this summer, so bear with me as I go over these results with you, but I'm very excited to share them with you. So for the background, for many of you who don't know about the e-waste program in Indiana, it started in July 1st of 2009, and we started receiving that reporting data in 2010. The purpose of this program is to reduce the amount of e-waste that goes into landfills. 
like I said, as we have a law for e-waste, it is illegal in the state of Indiana for any of those electronic devices to go into our landfills. So we're working very hard to make sure that we educate businesses, communities, manufacturers, and the public to let them know how to recycle this material properly. So we work on responsible management and hazardous substance, substances, uh, recovery of value materials like precious metals, glass and plastics, and our key stakeholders are manufacturers, collectors, and recyclers. For devices that we work with mostly is our covered electronic devices or CEDs. As many of you would know about these, pretty popular if you go into your local Best Buy. We work with televisions, computer monitors, e-readers, fax machines, digital photo frames, digital media players, iPods, camcorders, and the works. So for the manufacturer results for 2020, we had 69 manufacturers register for the Indiana eCycle program compared to 75 in 2019. So we had a slight increase there. Manufacturers collectively had a 16.8 million pound recycling obligation goal for the past program year. And we were able to boost that up to 22 million pounds from 18 million pounds the previous year. For collector results in 2020, we had 83 collectors register with a total of 16.3 million pounds of CEDs collected. 12.8 million pounds collected from metropolitan counties and 5.5 million from non-metropolitan counties. For recycler results for 2020, we saw an increase in recyclers registering with 27 recyclers registering for the e-cycle program for 2020 compared to 23 in 2019, totaling up to 20.7 million pounds and we are proud to announce that since the IDEM program of the e-waste management in the law, we have collected over 350 million pounds of e-waste material, reducing that amount going into the landfill. So for outreach efforts, it was a little different in 2020 due to the pandemic. So we were a little creative, as you can see. Um, so we did attend the IRC's annual conference virtually. We did some Earth Day Indiana festivals um, safely doing social distancing, educating the local areas in like Garfield Park on what we're doing for collections um, and various community events, talks away days and working with all these management districts. Um, we did host an e-waste collection event at the Indiana government centers and local regional offices that was extremely successful. It was a two day event this year it was open to the public for the first time. So the Friday was just for government center employees and the Saturday was open to the public. During that, we were able to collect over 14,000 pounds to waste hauler trucks worth of material and over 30, I can't remember exactly, but it was over 300, 400 televisions during that. So we have several boxes that were just full of televisions that we were safely able to get out of the place this year. Um, we also did virtual Earth Day sessions this year where we worked on just general Earth Day lessons as well as the electronic sessions. We are wanting to boost up our electronic waste Earth Day lesson plans. So Jennifer Hellriegel and I are coming up with a new adaptation for electronic device recycling education for children. We're going to be working on doing dissembling of devices, showing children safely what are inside those valuable materials and why we should recycle those materials and not go into a landfill. Um, we have also conducted retailer education and compliance initiatives. So I'm currently working with local retailers as well as consumer websites that sell directly to the state of Indiana, delivering those items like Amazon and so on to educate them on our recycling needs here in Indiana and also continue their education on e-waste. Thank you again for having me. Again, my name is Kristen Kesters. If you have any questions, my contact information is there and we look forward to finishing up the rest of the um, e-cycle report and posting it online for you to view the entire report and data entries. It'll be on our Recycle Indiana, the Recycle.im.gov page under e-waste results.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Now we get to the fun part. And the next item on the agenda is consideration of the recycling promotion and assistance fund grant applications. We have had a plethora of excellent grant requests this year. And I think as a board, we all great uh, thank you to Representative um, Shively and Senator Arrington for their work in budget to allow us to have the monies to distribute as uh, we're responsible for um, to increase the recycling rate in the state of Indiana. With that, I want to remind all board members of our ethics um, considerations. And for the record, I will state that I will be recusing myself from four applicants. Those applicants are DAK Americas, um, the city of Lawrenceburg, DCEC Holding Company, TVA Clark County Transfer Recycling, and Madison Chemical Company Incorporated. And I have a business relationship through my uh, primary employer with those companies. Any others? I need to recuse myself from the uh, city of Lawrenceburg. We have a conflict of interest. And I also will be recusing myself from the city of Lawrenceburg. Bruce, I need to take care of plastic recycling and you know, uh, incorporate the GRI's relationship. I think. Have you submitted your paperwork to them? No, I did not get that on the phone. Line. Um, okay, we'll be in touch. I'll be in touch at this meeting. So just make sure that when they do talk, just don't say anything very nice during the application. You got it. Thank you, Mr. French. Thank you. With that, so I guess my question is on that to clarify it. So I stay in line and, and um, Mesh, I guess my question would be is. If we have direct relationships with them as part of the company companies you represent, you need to recruit yourself, correct? I think I think the most conservative approach would say yes. Yeah. So I would likely uh, stay back up and recruit myself from the plastic recycling. All right. And I would recommend you get with Mr. French afterwards yeah. as well. As well as the Shelby County Recycling District. Um, yeah. Again, I'll just reiterate anytime that any of us recuse ourselves, we just want to um, avoid any conversation or promotion of those current requests. Very good. And, and looking at the top four grants by rank, this could be a very short meeting. So I think we need to make a decision you know, as a board, or consider it as a board as we look through the and look at the justification and whether the investment is clear and the return is going to be favorable, but also look at the remaining grant applications and because some of those are repeat grant requests and uh, some of them are just very interesting. Um, with that, I would like to ask, um, is there anyone from Plastic Recycling Incorporated available to speak to their grant request of $500,000? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Would you come forward, state your name, and kind of give, give us an overview of your project? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Fred Reed. I am a general manager of Plastic Recycling. Thank you to the board. Uh, Brandon Shaw, one of the owners, is also here as well. We are um, here in Indianapolis. We're a plastic recycling company, as the name implies. Um, we do mostly post-industrial plastic. We are getting into now 
the um, e-waste stream that uh, Kristen talked about a little bit ago. Um, we have a facility over on uh, State Avenue that uh, we are uh, working on and trying to expand. And that's what the grant process is. Uh, $1.4 million um, cost. We're asking for a half million dollars. Um, that will expand our capacity and also enable us to um, collect and uh, recycle at a higher level so that the waste scrap that we send out, the, the level of that uh, waste will go down. So our efficiency goes up. It's a Chinese facility or Chinese equipment, um, but it's a, a fairly high quality and uh, one of the, the better uh, units in the world right now. So we anticipate hiring 17 individuals, about $800,000 in salary benefits. Um, and if we get the grant that we've applied for, we believe that we can have the equipment running sometime um, third quarter next year. We anticipate um, also in about 12 million pounds of recycled material that could flow through that equipment once we get it up and running. What's the primary type of uh, plastic that you're going off of? What makes the PE, the PET? But mostly it's a PP and PS, some P, uh, uh, HDPE, but and also some PC. Um, but PS and PP are, are the focus of what we're trying to uh, get out of that waste stream. Polystyrene and polypropylene. Yes. Thank you. We're doing some of that right now. This equipment will just increase the efficiency of the process so that we don't have to throw away as much as we are right now. Yes, sir. You certainly have a uh, established track record in using the money that we've given you, you know, in the past. And I'm a little, the fact that you're kind of changing directions a little bit, maybe a little more receptive uh, to considering this grant request again, since you're going into it with a different direction. And, um, but still, we have supported you numerous times in the past, and I'm a little concerned about uh, giving you four five hundred thousand dollars just because of that reason. So I asked you, what's the bare minimum that you need uh, to successfully implement this program? Because we've given you quite a bit in the past, right? And and. We, we thank the board for that, the state of Indiana, certainly. That has helped um, us grow our company, um, but we also understand and believe that we have helped the, the environment by taking out waste out of the, the uh, feed stream. And I think this, all, this project also, it, it just to address the kind of the, the changing priority, it's something that we've um, kind of envisioned that because of e-waste, I think um, Kristen touched on that a little bit, and, and you, you hear about the uh, waste streams with all of the, the plastic and the metals and, and whatnot that are involved in electronics nowadays. And just because of the, the obsolescence that, that we go through with, you know, you get a, a new phone every two or three uh, years, uh, some people get new phones every year, but um, to your point, we see that, that that waste stream continues to expand, and I think all of the research indicates that that will only continue to grow, and we're focusing on that not only from an uh, environmental standpoint, but also from an economic standpoint, and um, we think that this, this equipment that we put in the grant will help us uh, grow that business and and also help uh, the environment as well uh, from a kind of a, you know, 
economic and an environmental standpoint. Um, how much do we need to do the project? I think that we probably would do the project um, regardless of how much the board gave us, honestly. Uh, just to be honest with you, I think certainly it would help us continue to grow if we got the full five hundred thousand um, dollars. But I think we're prepared to probably do it. But I, I appreciate your honesty, and I, I supported the uh, funding you again. It's just the level of funding that I'm having some difficulty to understand. Yes, ma'am. Um, right now, all the, the waste from electronics is being handled in Indiana by other companies. You are proposing to start a business where you would handle some of that yourself, right? So are we just are we just changing where that e-waste is going from one processor to yours, or how are we increasing recycling by well, this project? Well, what we're trying to do is we're we're not going to be the front end. We're uh, kind of a specialized process. We take material um, from other processors who, who take in the material on front end. So the electronic waste, the TVs, the, the computers, whatever come in, they're disassembled, the, the parts are taken apart. We actually have specialized equipment that we will take that the plastics, uh, that's what we're focused on, that's what we want and we'll take that out of the, the feed stream instead of going to the uh, landfills. So what we're trying to do is take the, the plastic, reduce the amount going to the landfills um, and, and use that in our processes. Um, we turn around and sell that back out to uh, manufacturers here in the state and elsewhere. So is the material that you're receiving contaminated, what is it contaminated with that the sorting is going to improve? You know, the different materials, when it comes from a source, it, it's sometimes in bulk form, sometimes it's shred, and the material is, is kind of co-mingled, if that makes sense. It's, we call it contaminated, but it may have several different materials in there, um, maybe co uh, commingled with uh, polypropylene, polyethylene, polystyrene. It may have fire retardant materials in there. It may have some metals in there. It may have paper, cardboard, glass. Um, so it just depends on where we get the material from and how good or how well they um, clean that material up. We have to then take that material and refine it and separate the materials out so we can use that poly propylene or polystyrene in our manufacturing process. So it's, it's, a, it's our ability to take those elements and separate them. And then we can use that rather than try to, you, you really can't use that commingled or contaminated material. So is it, is it primarily different types of plastics? I mean, I assume that the e-waste the e processors are pulling out the metals some of them are, some of them. Most of the, I mean, gold and, and platinum and whatever else is in there, they're taking, that's that's primarily what they're focused on is taking metal out. And what's left, there's a little bit of residual metal in there um, and then some of the other materials as well. So when, when <clears throat> you sort it or with this new machine as it gets sorted better, then you end up with the plastics you want, the different types of plastics, the metals, do the metals then go back to the source? Usually the metals, it's a small amount and we'll just, um, if we can recycle those, we will give those to a metal recycler uh, okay. or sell them to a metal recycler. Um, honestly, again, the, the folks that we get our material from are focused on the metals. So they try to get as much of that out as they can, but there is some residual metal left. And so when we get that, the process that, that we're trying to get is, is a, a process of sink flow tanks, which water, the metal sink, some of the plastic flows, some of the plastic sinks. Um, and then there are some electronics that the metal goes through. It charges the plastic and that helps separate the plastic. 
So the process is, um, again, one of trying to refine the feed stream so that we can use that better in our manufacturing process. Can you, can you address the, right now plastics is great. It's a great time for plastics and commodity rates are very high on plastics. Obviously with the fuel and or the crude price side. How do you position yourself in the event that the crude drops and people want to go back to working plastics? Well, actually, the price of virgin is almost the same as recycled right now. As you said, uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the whole economics of plastic is interesting because of the price of uh, oil. And we have gone through cycles, just like everybody else, where the price of oil goes up, price of oil comes down. And we have to, what we do, what we anticipate or try to anticipate is that swing or that those um, highs and lows. And when we buy raw materials, we try to anticipate that. Our pricing goes up and down, just like you know markets do all over. And so as, as you inferred, as the price of oil will come down, as it does come down, we have to adjust our marketing and our buying and selling prices and, and costs. Uh, it's been a challenge over the last several months, certainly because of uh, several different things, COVID, the weather, you know, all of that. And our costs are going up. We're adjusting selling prices um, when it comes down and we anticipate it will come down. We'll have to adjust our, not only our buying, but our selling as well. And, um, you know, we've done it for 30 some years. So we, we uh, anticipate being able to do that for the market. Thank you. You've been an excellent partner. Uh, we, had, we appreciate IDEM and uh, RMDB. Um, I think uh, we appreciate the trust that you guys, the board has uh, entrusted in us and, and hopefully we will continue to do that. Any other questions from any board members? Hearing none, I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, in the course of review, so we take them one by one, or do you want to um, listen to the presentations of several before making awards? I would like to hear from, I think, the top six. All right. We have a recommendation here from the top six. We have any disagreement or agreement with that? I'd like to um, also hear from Clark. We have a recommendation to hear from the top six and then a request for an overview from um, the Clark County Transfer Recycling Application. Is that what I'm understanding, Terry? Yes. Well, I'll say we can talk about the top six. I'd like to add Clark County to that. All right. Any objections by any board members? Hearing none, um, do we have a representative from Revolution Plastics Holding LLC, DBA Revolution Tech Award? And I hope everyone understands this is your opportunity to tell us. Why you're better than the one before you? Sharpening. <laughs> <laughs> Sharpening. <laughs> that pressure's on. Now. That's right. Got to do a dance. Got to do something. 
all that. It'll be very uh, underwhelming here. <laughs> that, if you would state your name, please. Yeah, my name is Louis Vasquez. I'm the vice president of business development for Revolution Company, which uh, just acquired Giant Core Recycling back in uh, January, I guess February of uh, 2021. Um, I guess just kind of go into the little introduction, uh, Mr. Burrow. Is that, is that absolutely Burrow? correct? So yeah, so we uh, Jagco Recycling has been in business uh, for over 50 years in Indiana. Um, really focused on post-industrial recycling for its entire uh, for its entire time in business. Um, we when we acquired Revolution as a uh, plastic film company, um, we focus on closed loop manufacturing of all plastic films, um, mostly L LD, uh, a little bit of, uh, of uh, LLD. Um, anyway, we, we manufacture those films, trash bags, agriculture films, um, carry out bags. But, but our goal is to incorporate the largest amount of post-consumer resin that we can. Um, and so what we've done is actually invested in recycling and reverse logistics to um, control those parts of the value chain so that we can incorporate, you know, recycled material, post-consumer recycled material into our products that, you know, we really know the origin of, so we can manage the quality of, et cetera. Um, and so as we uh, thought through, you know, acquiring JACOR and, and uh, partnering with the Doty family, um, we, we really focused on transitioning their business from post-industrial uh, recycling to post-consumer recycling, you know, maintaining their legacy post-industrial recycling, and adding post-consumer recycling. And this would be the, the first phase of that. Um, they have a, a, a warehouse there where in, in, in Terre Haute, Indiana, um, where they you know, basically store their post-industrial scrap right now. And we're proposing uh, changing that into a post-consumer recycling facility um, that would be focused on distribution plastics. So uh, mostly stretch wraps, you know, things that are, that are wrapped around pallets in, in the distribution process of uh, consumption of goods. Um, we are, you know, really looking at initially this phase one, a 30 million pound plant. Um, so we'd be recycling 30 million pounds of post-consumer distribution plastic film. Uh, that would uh, entail um, about three million dollar uh, investment, uh, eight to ten jobs uh, of of really direct laborers to to manage the recycling process. Um, that would be phase one. Really attract our company to Indiana. Frankly, um, we've got you know seven manufacturing plants across the country, uh, three other recycling plants outside of Jadcor, and so we're really looking at you know. Uh, where to locate this this investment and and basically grow a you know national or really really regional um, post consumer recycling effort. Uh, so that initial thirty million pounds would be again phase one eight to ten jobs and then we'd aggressively look to move to a much larger investment um, of more like you know forty five million dollars where we'd be uh, basically creating. Uh, you know, close to about 100 million pounds of, of recycling for post-consumer. Um, and that would include the, the full process, reverse logistics, um, you know, washing, palletizing, and then, uh, and then that material would be you know, basically sent to the, 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 the pellets, post-consumer pellets we make would be sent to um, film manufacturers uh, and also we, you know, our own company included. Um, so we basically, would have a pretty strong control on our market for this material. Um, and then in addition to that, we've, we've recently partnered with a Canadian based uh, Virgin, uh, Virgin LDPE, uh, low density polyethylene uh, manufacturer, Nova Chemical, to uh, sell these resins, help us commercialize them. So uh, we're currently selling about 10 million pounds a year with them. And, you know, this would, you know, Further support growth with that. Most of the LDPE material now is being marketed to trucks. Yes, that's right. So, would that you consider that to be one of your largest competitors? Yeah, they are. You know, look, the the logistically speaking with LDPE, um, it's it's a thin film, and so there's a lot of surface area on that material. 
um, that lends itself towards uh, really high cost in terms of uh, contamination when you start moving at long distances. Trex is located in, uh, I believe, Sparks, Nevada is their main plant, and then they have another plant. I think it's in South Carolina, but don't quote me on that. Um, anyway, they're, they're going to be pulling from those regions, you know, western, eastern regions. Um, the upper Midwest for us, given uh, the population density, uh, you know, with, with you know, here, Chicago, even proximity to New York, other big markets, um, this, is, this is more regional focus for us. We think we can source most, if not all, of our plastic from this area and not really have a, a major uh, competitive effort with, with Trex. Now, they, they are the biggest, uh, really, right? And they just kind of them and and then uh, the export market, which you know has been kind of dwindling since uh, the national sort um, from China in 2018. But uh, but yeah, they, they, they set pricing, and our economics will work such that uh, it's they, they they're a competitor, but very kind of tertiary given the regionality. Okay. I don't want to be viewed as a mega fancy here, but um, a lot of companies have put out in their sustainability goals. The elimination of LDPE bags. And how will that impact your operations? Yeah. So, um, look, it's something that we monitor very closely as a company across all of our our, our plants. Um, we we feel like look, there is a lot of efforts moving against plastic, right? A lot of negativity, um, a lot of a lot of people pushing the paper, uh, which is in some, in my opinion, at least, uh, less sustainable than plastic. Um, I think that uh, those trends you know, will continue, frankly, uh, those pressures, I should say, but a uh, bigger, bigger uh, tailwind that we see is just demand for post-consumer. Uh, and we feel that the reason, you know, a lot of that negativity is coming is because there is really no domestic uh, infrastructure for the recycling of plastic film, you know, really recycling LDPE. And so um, we are hoping to change that, frankly, and really change that narrative. Thank you. You mentioned stretch wrap, and I uh, happen to walk through a whole lot of manufacturing facilities throughout the state, and I see a whole lot of stretch wrap. Sure. The, the big issue that I always encounter is they don't have anybody that will pick it up. Sure. So can you talk a little bit about the supply and yeah. the flow? Yeah, yeah. So basically, um, yeah, we partner with with you know just largely distribution companies. Um, uh, to basically, uh, you know, either sort of you know, site on their facility, bailers, or uh, certainly trucks, um, where they could load that stretch wrap into those trucks, and then we'd, we'd send trucks and basically pick up the, the full um, container and swap it out with a new one. And uh, we, we look to set up long-term supply contracts with, with those manufacturers. Um, in, in some cases, depending on how much... Uh, how much effort they're putting into uh, source separating that material from other films that are used in their processes. Um, we'll even pay them for that film. Um, you know, if they're bailing it, certainly we'll pay them for it, you know, just compensate them for the labor and the cost to you know, maximize the weight of that truck. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of, you know, what we do, uh, you know, in, in, in some, you know, much larger cases, larger companies like say Targets or Kroger's, where they have you know, very big distribution centers that are producing you know, upwards of a million, two million pounds a year. We might even you know, staff some, some people on their site to help them just manage that material. Um, we're basically looking at taking grades A through C um, of stretch film. So you know, the, 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 the market for stretch film uh, is graded in that way. Grades A through C of natural color is what we're gonna focus on. Um, and uh, in time, especially as we go into kind of phase two and three, uh, really focus on the lower grades. So really maximize uh, the amount of material we can grab closer um, and uh, really look at our own automated sorting of that material to, to you know, basically bring out as much value from that, that waste stream as possible. Yeah. Well, I'll ask you the same question that uh, Yes. Okay. Yes, we're okay. Right. Get along with Wes. Yeah. So you know, I this think this is the shark deal. Yeah, that's good. Huh? <laughs> well, I realize it's a good one. Yeah. Um, I think you can live with a bit less. I might 
mean to give some to somebody else. <laughs> sure, you know, look, I, I uh, wish that uh, I was the ultimate decision maker of my company. Unfortunately, I'm not. Um, and so, you know, this for us is uh, would be a major stake in the ground to, you know, start the process of locating this, this major plant, major plant for, uh, we feel that the entire Midwest, certainly Indiana, um, here in the state, you know, we've, we've got locations in uh, Oakdale, Minnesota, and uh, in uh, Shelbyville, uh, Tennessee, um, where we're also looking at locating this Dallas, Texas as well. You know, and, and frankly, it's, it's uh, yes, we could take less, you know, we're, we're, we're a larger company, but um, my fear would be that, you know, it could steer us from investing in another state, frankly. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Next applicant we have is Clearline. We have a representative from Clearline in the audience. I believe I was emailed that Al is uh, calling via phone from Canada. Al, if you are on the, the Zoom call via phone, uh, you would need to unmute yourself by pressing star six. Let's see if we can get technology to work for us. Uh, control to Al. Maybe he is not on. I have a question for Julia, if I may. And previously we had the waste tire fund. That's not in existence anymore. It's located in the Office of Land Quality in Nottingham. And because I'm looking at this, you know, <clears throat> application, and they're more looking at TBF tire drive fuel. And I didn't know if that would be more applicable to the waste tire fund or if that's something because normally we steer away from tires, that would not. When, when we've stayed away from tires, it's tire for energy. Um, but, you know, we still fund recycling projects. Okay. I don't know. If they and, 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 and again, and like, you know, our evaluations of look at municipal solid waste conversion, and it's obviously tires are a little bit unique from that perspective, too. Do we have Al available? Any representative from Clearline? Just double checking. He sent another email. He he's in Canada, so apparently Zoom does not the Zoom link did not work for out of country representatives, and we didn't find that out till this morning. Is it possible that you could text him and ask him to call? He, he says you can certainly call me if something comes up during the meeting. <laughs> Which I can call him and put him on speaker, I suppose. Yeah. All right. Let's give this a try. We have a speaker phone. Do you want to use? It is not even set up again right now. Or maybe what? Well, you go up the next one. Let me see if I can. While well, we're trying to figure out how to, how to speak with the representative from Clearline. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly and she can address the next applicant as I recuse myself from DAK Americas. Do we have somebody in the room to speak on behalf of DAK Americas? <clears throat> Would introduce yourself and then uh, tell us a little bit about your work project. My name is Jeremy Jawine. I'm the plant manager at Bath and Ridges in Richmond. And I will attempt to answer all your questions before you have a chance to uh, to ask them. So our project is a two point seven million dollar project in which we're asking for five hundred thousand um, of the grant funds. Um, our project is to add optical sorters to the beginning process of, of our existing um, operations. This would enable us to do a couple of things. One, it would enable us to increase our end fee by um, 500,000 per month. 
for approximately six at, at minimum and up to 8.7 uh, million pounds per, per year. Uh, that's a recycled material. We recycle PET bottles. Uh, so we do take that from curbside material, uh, from um, MRFs, uh, as much of you may, may understand and, and actually even be a part of. Um, we are doing this in the, in, uh, the goal of having a Economy, which we're already in the process of building. Uh, our company just invested a $35 million project, which has um, actually started uh, producing this, this past month. Uh, it's a pelletizing process where we take our um, curbside material, process it through our existing process, which we're wanting to upgrade, um, and then we uh, create those PT pellets to go into bottle. Uh, food grade application. Uh, so it's truly a, a um, uh, circular economy created right here in Indiana and uh, manufactured right here in the main, uh, Indiana bottle to uh, recovery, back to bottle. Um, doing that, uh, we also, uh, with this added optical sortation, will be able to uh, remove a lot of the waste um, before the existing process to allow us have, to have better capabilities um, and clean up material and increase our throughputs, um, therefore uh, meeting our customer needs. Um, this would um, also decrease what we send to the landfill by 2.2% which is 111,000 per month or 1.3 million per year. Uh, this, in, in removing these plastics from the landfill, we would be recovering the twos and fives, which will further process through our existing equipment. We just need the capability of getting it out so we can send it to that existing equipment in order to recover it and therefore make it a sellable product. Um, so, uh, overall, this project will increase our throughputs, allow us to uh, process 500,000 uh, more product or 6 million up to 8 million per, per year and keep 1.3 million pounds out of the line bill. Uh, see any additional uh, benefits. Uh, it will also help us um, maintain cleaner process water, reduce MTSS that goes into our um, municipalities and our um, um, process water that goes back to the city. Um, I know that there was a question with uh, 500,000 being the request. Um, if we would be able to take any less. Um, right now, uh, with the $30 million project that we just finished, uh, this project would be a phase two. We're also putting in just under $5 million project, uh, which is actually starting now. Um, and it'll go up through the end of the year uh, for reliability of the existing plant. Uh, so, we also, uh, as a company, uh, acquired a similar uh, uh, facility in Reading, PA, $65 million this year. And we also have an operating facility that we're cur uh, currently converting from fiber to food grade in um, Fayetteville, North Carolina. So there's a lot of competing um, facilities that's that's moving along the same path as the Richmond facility um, that we're competing for capital funds for. Um, so if we don't get the, the full five hundred thousand, I fear that it may either postpone or move this project to another another state. Thank you. And are there any, with the addition of this new equipment, are there any additional jobs? 
we did just uh, with the, the $35 million project, we did bring on 30 additional jobs. Um, whereas this specific project will not add or subtract any jobs, but it will essentially lose jobs. You mentioned that your uh, stream comes from curbside recycling. It does, yes. what, what is the reach or, or the area that, that you're pulling from? Uh, throughout the whole US, we do um, have, you know, local Indiana um, merch that we do uh, bring material in from. So in it, it's roughly about 10% of our overall um, sort of three, 3.6 billion that we, that we use. And this is a little bit outside, but I'm curious because I know a lot of the, especially more rural areas, um, recycling programs are really struggling financially and a lot of them have been shrunk. Do you guys ever get involved on that end to help get more local collection happening? We do. We have a, an entire procurement um, team that reaches out. They have personal relationships with a lot of the manufacturers, the MRFs um, in, the, in, the, in the Indiana area. We visit those MRFs. We try and work with those MRFs on you know, what their needs are, what our needs are, um, to try and make that fit. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the board? Mm -hmm. You asked mine, sorry, about the jobs. All right. Thank you very much. Turn it back to yours. Any update, Sienna, on? Yeah, I think we're going to try to see if we can hear him on my phone because using this requires a lot of plugging in and setting up. <laughs> so we'll see how strong the speaker is on my phone. Yeah, maybe you can just I can pull over there. Yeah. <laughs> see how this works. See how it's not IT. Right? <laughs> Learning new skills. Hi, Al. This is Deanna Garner at the Recycling Market Development Board meeting. Hi, Deanna. Hi. You are on speakerphone for everybody. Can any everybody hear that at all? Can you all hear Al, can you, you speak a few words again? Yeah, hi. Hi, Deanna. How are you? Can anybody hear me? Yes, yeah, it will. It will work. <laughs> We're discussing your grant proposal. Like, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I'm like, I will put it as close to our, our microphone as possible. Um, yeah, I think that um, I'm going to hand it over to our chairman, but they just wanted um, to discuss your grant proposal a little bit. If you would please state your full name. Um, my name is uh, Alan Mason. Alan, Mason. last name again? Mason with uh, two S's, M-A-S-S-O-N. -S -S Thank you. Um, could you possibly just give us a brief overview of your project, sir? Sure. Uh, we are a Canadian company that is moving all our manufacturing down to Indiana. 90% uh, of our business is, uh, is in the U.S. And expanding a product line. Uh, so we're going to be growing significantly and it's a good time for us to move. Um, we purchased a building already in Muncie, Indiana, and uh, we're going to start moving our equipment in January. Uh, we're going to be, uh, as we currently are, we mold products out of recycled tires. Uh, my history is doing that for over 20 years in another Canadian company, um, and I was hired by uh, Clearline and their business and uh, one of the first steps is to move it to Indiana. Um, we're going to be vertically integrating our rubber process so we're not just going to be buying uh, powdered rubber or chrome rubber, we're going to be buying tire chips from a company in northern Indiana. Uh, we're going to be putting a cracker mill in that facility um, and it's going to make our production extremely efficient and less dependent on chrome rubber uh, materials. Uh, we're going to be buying tire-derived fuel, or TDF, and crumbing that down to the size we need and processing that uh, and molding the products in Indiana. It's a very clean technology. There's no smokestacks that come out of the building. There's no water used in the process. 
Um, and uh, uh, we currently use about 5 million pounds of uh, chrome rubber a year. But with our growth path uh, that we're on, uh, we would expect to be running 24 hours a day out of that facility um, almost efficient, almost immediately. We're open by February. We move equipment or start moving equipment in January uh, and hopefully by February start production and uh, then slowly move equipment completely out of our Canadian facility in Indiana during the year. Um, we're very excited about it. In my history, I've processed probably 200 million pounds of recycled barber, and uh, we know we're going to be getting uh, probably 20, 30 million pounds of material through that factory over the next uh, couple of years uh, on an annual basis. So we're very excited about uh, using up Midwest rubber, uh, hiring people, and turning it into uh, a green solution. Um, so uh, it's very general, but if you have any specific questions, uh, I'm more than happy to answer them. How many jobs will you be bringing to the state, sir? What was that? I couldn't make that out. How many jobs will be um, involved with this process? Uh, well, to start, certainly uh, we've already met with uh, uh, potential operations managers. So we're going to hire our operations manager mechanical team first. Uh, and then as we move equipment down, we're going to hire production people. Uh, so we would say that in the first uh, three, four months, we're going to need at least uh, 20 people. Uh, but once we get everything rolling, it'd probably be a good 40 people or so that we're going to need uh, 40 to 50 people uh, based on uh, our, our, our current needs uh, that will be in that facility. Thank you. Any other questions from board members? Do you, can you get along with less than $500,000? Uh, as you saw in the application, um, Unlike many people in the recycled rubber world, uh, we've seen many people try and fail. Uh, we have an extremely strong bottom line. We have an extremely strong balance sheet. Um, uh, so, yeah, so we, uh, to be honest, we would, we're going to be going ahead with this, uh, but uh, it would be a very significant uh, help. Uh, we could certainly go with you know, a couple of, a couple hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand. But uh, certainly, this, this machine itself that we want to acquire uh, from the Indiana business is a million dollar machine. Um, so uh, that's why we're thinking that would be uh, the, the fairest. Uh, but uh, yes, yeah, so we we could move along with this. It was uh, about half a million dollars. May I ask where the machine is um, developed and manufactured? Excuse me? Where is the machine uh, manufactured? In uh, northern Indiana, it's a company is called Jomar. Uh, and let me just, uh, I'll get the exact uh, location. I think it's in uh, near Elkhart, Indiana. Uh, just, uh, Very good. That answers my question, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any other questions from board members? We're also going to be getting the, their sister company is one of the largest uh, recycle or recycled tire uh, shredding operations in, in, the, in the United States of America, certainly in the Midwest. Uh, and we're going to be getting tires from them as well. So we're excited that we're not going to be uh, getting tires from further out. It's going to be tires from uh, Indiana as well. One of those uh, sources I just want to point out is Intech, which is another applicant. Yeah, Intech, Intech is associated with Jomar. Jomar and Intech are owned by Lebron, okay. uh, Delweiler, um, and they're a, a fabulous organization, and we're sort of teamed up with them for this. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Hearing none, sir, I thank you very much for your participation and your explanation. And we appreciate it. Uh, call me back if there's anything else. And uh, thank you very much for your time. We'll do that. Thank you, Al. Thank you. The next applicant we have after clear line would be plus five Indiana LLC. Plus five. 
you. It's Paul Andrade. I'm the CEO of Plus Five Global Inc. Plus Five LLC, Indiana. Um, our project is a processing scrap tires and utilizing a pyrolysis process. And we're converting them from a tire base material and generating materials that are in within the tire. We go to a, a carbon product, we have a petroleum product, we have steel that comes out of the tire, and we have a gas that is produced. So consequently, we're producing products that are not tire related, that are still considered a, a solid waste on, on IDAP's part. So by taking those, those materials out of the tire and taking it back to its constituent components, we're open to a lot of new markets. And what we've focused on is we've got a recycling process, but the whole thing about pyrolysis companies that have had problems is the fact that they generate materials that don't have a high enough quality to them to sell the materials at a viable price to make the pro forma work. So they rely on tipping fees. They rely on subsidies. With the process that we're taking, we're generating a high enough forecast on our revenue projections because we've already tested our, our product from the lab perspective as well as the customer perspective. So yes, we are a startup company. We do not have tra a track record. Our first site that's going on in Northern Indiana is part of what this application is, is for. The funds that go into it to help set up that equipment. Um, likewise, the other thing that we're doing is we're working with the uh, Department of Agriculture and we've made a presentation to IDEM to go after the tires that the others don't want. And that's the agricultural equipment related tires. Those things are large. A lot of equipment doesn't take them. We don't cut the tires up, we process them whole. So we could take that eight foot tire and stick it right straight into our machine. That lowers our front end cost down because we don't have to cut it up. And oh, by the way, when you cut it up, you just cut the steel up. So now you got to get the steel out of the carbon that your carbon guys don't want. So we've lowered our, our insertion cost by doing this. Um, this project is in uh, Northern Indiana and as a developer of, of uh, industrial projects for my career for over 40 years, my own project is the first one I've come across where we've actually deliberately delayed the startup of it. And that's because of an opportunity that we had come to us. We have a company in Northern Indiana that generates a very large amount of waste. That waste is being used by another company that is setting up their first operations in Northern America in Northern Indiana that's gonna be taking that waste and producing a product from that. In the production of that product, they need a lot of gas. And we're gonna provide the gas 100% of what they need for their dryer process to go along in the generation of their products. So that assembly of those three companies going together and supporting each other with that ultimate narrative of recycling is really strong on, on our part. And the fact that we are able to take a byproduct that we have 100% of and use it directly into a process that helps another company. So that's something that we're really looking forward to. So that opportunity said, hey, let's take the, the, the project you have, and let's just put it on hold for about six to nine months. And so we've actually done that and we've had not actually helped. So the timing now is really working out right where the request that we have for the list of equipment is fitting into this new facility that is, uh, is slated to go in there in Northern Indiana, um, starting actually next year, beginning next year. Answer your question, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we can take less, and the reason is because Mark Keelan over there. <laughs> we all pay attention when somebody asks a question. We always make sure we get an answer. Um, our, our request had 20 some odd pieces of equipment in there. And so we have any combination of those equipment that we can take. Obviously, as a startup company, um, um, funds are, are hard to get, and it's very valuable. So we would like to obviously receive as much as we can, but um, the honest truth is, yes, we can take less than, than what it is that we have uh, we've shown in there. May I ask, what, pardon me, what residual products do you have after you take your carbon, steel, and your gas, and then what is the gas? The, the, the gas is a, uh, it's a natural gas type of, of a gas. 
uh, has like a higher methane type of gas. Yes, uh, it's a it has a higher BTU rating than natural gas does, and so uh, it's it's valuable as a fuel source. In our business plan, we've contemplated cogening it so we can generate electrical power and put it right straight back into the grid. That's the alternative we were looking at in our original site. But what this particular gas user wanting it straight, obviously that takes a chunk of money out of our budget by using it as a gas instead of electrical power. Sure. But when we get done with our, pro our, our process, there is nothing that goes to landfill. We're yeah. consuming the tire 100%. Excellent. I saw my first paralysis plant back in the 80s mm -hmm. down in Europe. And there was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Jack Bader in Michigan who did a lot of paralysis in the 80s. And paralysis works. I mean, I, I don't have any, any doubt that what you're the technology doing, works, yes. The technology works. The yes. problem which killed one of these projects was the, the price of oil, number one. And secondly, being able to continuously move the tire into the equipment since it's done in the vacuum. And you, you, you talk about match treatment. So are you putting everything in a container, so to speak, and then treating it one at a time? Yes. The problem with the continuous, and I've worked for and I have set up the processes for a continuous company in Washington State called Integrated Resource Recovery. And they experienced the same thing that, that you were explaining. The problem that the, with a lot of the continuous is getting the product through the machine on a consistent basis. Some of it lags behind, some of it moves forward. It's in there for a shorter time, lower temperatures. So you get material that comes out that isn't consistent. And so consequently, what we've done is we've looked at and said, okay, we're going to focus on the sellability of these products. What processes really guarantees a higher sellability of them? And that is the batch process. And if you guys look at your TV set and watch these programs and how they make food products, pharmaceuticals, paint, metals, all this stuff, what do they use? They use the batch process. One's pot cooking, it all goes in, it's exactly the same, you can control the environment. And in, in doing so, you've got repeatability, you've got quality, you've got audit from one to the next. So when you go for your 9,000 ISO 9000 standardization program, you've got the process that follows that. That coupled with the parameters that we're running it at, our carbon, well, our carbon is so dry that that petroleum has been taken completely out of it. It rings when you fondle it in your hand. And because you're not stirring it, you're also not getting the carbon in the, py the pyro gas, which gets condensed into your oil and into the, the, uh, the, the gas as well. The other thing is, is that we have a patent, we have patents for our oil product to be used as a paraffin inhibitor. And that is when you put the oil down into a crude oil well, to break up the wax that's plugging the well. So when oil prices fluctuate, it actually helps us because when the prices go down, they can't afford to drill, they wanna unclog their existing wells, that's where this paraffin inhibitor, and that's where the industry comes in. It's a $12 billion industry. It's not something new, it's an alternative product with a green label on it. And, um, uh, and from the standpoint of, of um, of the carbon, it, it's a recycled product, product that goes into rubber, it goes into plastics, it goes into paints, it goes in the color market, it goes all over. So we're not pigeonholed into a single product market that we're, we're seeking out there. We've got a wide variety of capabilities. How big is the batch? It must have turned around time. Um, what, I... what, what we're planning on is two cycles per day, uh, 7,000 pounds, per batch with 12 machines. And what we'll be doing is starting off this first site with two machines, and then we will be ramping them up as, as time progresses. So uh, we will be able to, as the feedstock arrangements come in, uh, we'll be able to, uh, to bring in the machines. And those 12 machines would uh, process about 2.8 million tires. Some look at it and say, oh, yeah, but you know, you're shutting the machine down, you're cooling it down, you heat it back up, you're losing production time. Yes, we are. But 
the return is the product comes out at such a high quality, we can get the prices for that. And that's where our paraffin inhibitor really makes a big difference because instead of selling it for a couple bucks a gallon, we're selling it for much higher than that. <clears throat> Okay. Yes. How many jobs will be created? We have 76 in the plant. And it's currently operating? Uh, no, we have a pilot machine that we've operated and uh, the site is being uh, finalized actually probably within the next week. And then we will, we will be starting construction. So you have all of your permits required through air, water? No, we're working with Karamita on that. And so they are, are, are working with us on, on getting those. And we have our, our machines being designed as well too. That process is, is in motion. We've, our project is actually now, instead of being a standalone uh, by ourselves, we're now integrating our project with the construction of a 200,000 plus square foot building for the other operator and the logistics systems that we're setting up to be able to get their feedstock. Actually, we can use their trucks to get our feed stock as well too. Convince me that if awarded hundreds of thousands of dollars that you will receive your air permit. Um, the fact that we've already had our machine permitted in the state of Idaho and in the state of Wyoming. Um, not only that, when, when pyrolysis was first being reviewed by the state of California, which the uh, University of Riverside did their study and the EPA data from when they did their analysis came from our pilot machine. Now, if pyrolysis has been accepted from data from our machine, which is very old, okay, it's got new burners on it, yes, but it's quite old. Plus the fact that we've had it permitted in two other states, I know we're gonna get permitted. And when talking with Karamita, they're very convinced. They've seen all of our data. They're putting together the modeling. They're 100% confident, 99% confident that they're going to get the, the permits, uh, uh, permits through. It's a matter of, of accepting and going through the process. Thank you very much. Any other questions? No, I thank you very much, sir. It sounds like a very interesting and innovative project. Thank you. Next applicant we have is Shelby County Recycling District. We have a representative from Shelby County available. Good morning, board. My name is Lisa Carpenter and I'm the executive director of the Shelby County Recycling District. Thank you, Lisa. Can you give us a brief overview of your project, please? I sure will. And I would like to thank you for considering my proposal. I wish I could be there personally to thank all of you. But our program um, is basically because we've received grants from IDEM in the past. In 2017, the city of Shelbyville Street Department received a grant from your agency to start curbside recycling. Then in 2019, the recycling district received a grant to develop a recycling guide that went out to all households in Shelby County. With that being said, that increased our recycling numbers. Currently, the city of Shelbyville has committed to several housing developments that's going to increase the house count by 1,000. And with the current equipment that the city street department has, they cannot service those new homes. So what I'm asking for is money to purchase a new recycled packer truck and 95 gallon carts for the new houses. My estimate, and this is a conservative estimate, is we should be able to divert 229 tons of commingle recycling material from the landfill with this proposal. Also, the city of Shelbyville Street Department will be adding two employees to their workforce just to service the 1,000 new homes. All material will be sent to an Indiana Materials Recovery Facility. 
And the plan is to purchase the truck and the carts from Indiana companies. Any questions? Yes, I apologize. Um, are you purchasing an automatic side loader? What type of truck are you purchasing? Um, currently, the city of Shelbyville uses a rear load packer trucks, and that works really well for the areas that service because we have alleys and such like that. So we really don't have the capabilities to use that armed side load truck. And how many recycling cars do you have currently out? Uh, that you're collecting from? Um, I am sorry, I don't have that number. Thank you. Lisa, this is Debbie Hackman. How many rear load trucks do you run now to pick up recycling? One, and that has um, a route every day, Monday through Friday. And that, but you don't, you, do you know about how many homes that picks up? I would say, and this is an approximate guess, five thousand. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa, this is uh, Terry Guerin. This is very hard for me because you, everything you've touched, you've done an excellent job uh, in following through. Um, but I'm having difficulty with the purchase of a truck, number one. And secondly, what, what is the cost um, uh, that, you tr that is being charged to the citizens per month for recycling pickup. So the city provides that service at no charge to the residents. This is the problem I have because recycling is not free. It costs, it costs. And the citizens, if they want recycling, this is a personal bias I have, uh, should bear the cost of that program. So they're not being charged anything, but somebody's having to pay, you know, for the trucks and the routes and what have you. And and I know if, if the city was not picking up the recyclables and one of the private sector companies went in, the expectation would be that the private sector company would purchase those cars and then roll that cost into the cost of the service, the contract. So I am, like I said, this is hard for me because I know you and I know how, what a good job you do and everything you touch, but I, I cannot support um, your application because I think the citizens, they should be paying something that's not most of the cost of those cars. That should be well rolled into the cost of the program. Terry, I appreciate your opinion, um, but our program in 2017 was started with grant money. So this would just be adding on to that program Yours is one of them that I was thinking might well have been channeled towards the uh, community grant program. Uh, I realize the cost is is up there, but I just I just can't support buying carts. That's my problem. And it, it's not just Shelbyville. If it was any other municipality, I'd feel the same way. The private sector either needs to buy it and roll that into the cost of the program. If the city wants to initiate a, uh, a program, then they need to, to bear the cost initially themselves. It's sustainability is, is an issue in some of these uh, situations. Get grant money and, and seed money. And uh, 
the cost of program has to depend on the outside funding. The same would be true here with what you're asking, because you got grant money, you said earlier, to initiate the program, and, and now <coughs> you're asking for more. Lisa, and I step. think it's just because of the growth of the city and really truly the city street department has maintained the program with the current truck they have, their employees and such. It's just, we're asking for this funding because of the growth. I understand that. Lisa, this is Kelly uh, Just my two cents. Uh, I respectfully completely disagree with Terry. I and that was anticipated. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Thank you, I, Kelly. <laughs> I, I am a firm believer that if we want to increase our recycling rates, it should be included, like trash pickup. And if that is a cost that we pay via taxes, I don't believe it should be an added cost. That's a lot of people can't afford an extra $15 a month or whatever the cost may be. So I uh, respectfully disagree. Um, my concern or question is more so, uh, again, with the previous division with the community recycling grant program that this kind of does seem like a better fit for that. I understand the cost is um, may exceed that. Um, and I see that you've received two CRGB grants. Uh, one is still active. Did you want to uh, provide any additional information regarding those? Sure. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the first grant that the Shelby County Recycling District received was for a recycling guide. Um, and that was developed to let our community know what to do with items that they're unsure of. So it was an A to Z guide that was mailed to all residents of Shelby County. And that's been very, very effective um, with an seeing an increase in the items that we collect. Um, the second um, award is for recycle roll-off containers. Um, we have those throughout Shelby County. And in the past, um, they really don't have a message on them. They have a small sign from the hauler that we use to service them. This grant that we were awarded, we will have our name on it, and then we will have different messages on each recycle roll-off container, talking about our household hazardous waste collection center, um, talking about what can be recycled, talking about electronics and what we accept there. So we feel very, very fortunate from the past two awards that we've received because I think that's really impacted our work here in Shelby County and making us a clean environment. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa, this is <clears throat> Bruce Burrow. I'm not going to state my opinion on either Terry or Kelly's comment. And so I don't know how you feel. The <laughs> the um, trouble that I have with, with the application, to be quite honest with you, is the truck. And the question is, and I'll take your word for it, is there going to be enough work to keep the truck busy five days a week so that it's not periodically used for municipal solid waste collection? Yes, it will. And I will guarantee you it will never used to be picking up trash. I will promise you that. Thank you. Thank you. So this is Sandy Whitehead. Um, I have a question for you about the cart cost. So did you obtain more than one quote for the carts? I did not, no. We have used um, best equipment in the past and basically um, the cart per cost is $73.50. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other 
questions from board members? Hearing none, Lisa, I would like to thank you again for your application and uh, request and for what a good job you're doing in Shelby County. Thank you. Thank you for your consideration. I'd like to add the seventh on our list, if we can hear from them. Certainly. Is there uh, anybody here who represents Table Farms? Yes. Could you please state your name and give a brief description of your project? Hi there, sure. Uh, my name is Ryan Conway. Um, I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Babel Farms Indiana. Uh, I also co-own and co-manage uh, Green Camino Composting LLC, which is a, uh, a curbside composting company here in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, Babel Farms Indiana uh, was founded in 2017 and uh, we began uh, our composting journey um, in 2018. Uh, at the time, there was a, a separate uh, household curbside residential uh, collection startup that was getting going at the same time as Fable Farms was getting going, collecting um, coffee grounds from local coffee shops and some food waste from institutional kitchens like local sorority houses were right by IU. Um, we ended up, uh, my, my wife, who is the CEO of Fable Farms and the owner of Fable Farms, um, and she's also the CEO now and owner of uh, Green Camino, uh, she, be, she uh, bought um, a majority share interest in Green Camino uh, and became the primary owner um, in 2019. Um, but, you know, the whole time that she did not also own the curbside recycling or curbside composting business, we, we collaborated with them. Uh, they were just getting started. We were just getting started. So our, our partnerships with the city and the county uh, were very fluid. Green Camino got partnerships with the city of Bloomington uh, to service some of their government buildings and uh, to be allowed to conduct uh, pilot operations on residential collection routes. And then uh, Fable Farms partnered with uh, the Monterey County Solid Waste Management District um, uh, on, on pilot programs related to having drop-off sites at their recycling centers. Uh, so since my wife uh, essentially bought out uh, the original owners of Green Camino, um, our operations have been uh, uh, integrated in a sense. Uh, they're still legally distinct uh, because of insurance uh, issues. Uh, um, we're a very small composter and there's a lot of uh, you know, not, not a lot of insurance for uh, traditional commercial industrial composting really fits our model size. Um, so uh, we, this is like a farm-based um, agricultural product uh, and, and, and that, that just kind of exists and gets created on our micro farm. Um, so through these partnerships that uh, we've been able to really uh, vastly accelerate the collection and diversion of organic waste from Monroe County, uh, we have doubled every year our diversion rates uh, since our founding. Uh, I think last year we diverted around, I think 178 tons of, of food waste alone. I forget what the total uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the carbonation materials like uh, the leaves and, 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 and the, uh, the wood chips were, um, but essentially uh, what we are asking for um, is uh, the, you know, a, a, our project would cost $100,000. Uh, we would use, uh, um, 44 of that, well, essentially we'd use about 40 of that um, for purchasing um, a medium duty dump truck um, that our facility, Fable Farms, can use for managing feedstocks and for distributing compost uh, to local farmers and gardeners. And um, a Green Camino is contributing $10,000 of our match funding um, to be able to also occasionally borrow uh, uh, the truck, well, not occasionally, they would regularly borrow that same truck um, to be used for collecting from large generators like uh, small grocery stores, uh, breweries with you know, large rats, vats of spent grain, um, and then also for hauling manure um, from larger stable accounts. Uh, currently, uh, 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 Green Camino only has um, a uh, dump trailer um, and that, that we share with Fable, well, Fable Farms owns the dump trailer, but we share it with Green Camino. Um, so uh, that dump trailer can only haul about three, three and a half cubic yards of material. And right now Fable Farms only owns a very small 
like, you know, 28 horsepower uh, Kubota compact tractor that we used at the beginning to start our compost operation. Uh, we grew much faster than we anticipated, which is a great thing in terms of uh, uh, pushing the needle down on diverting food waste for the county's waste stream. Uh, uh, however, uh, that means that it, it quickly became outpaced uh, by our growth. So uh, right now we subcontract uh, the, we subcontract an operator who owns a bobcat, um, like a, nine, a 1992 bobcat uh, that has plenty of mechanical problems and breakdowns and is not very efficient. Um, and then also uh, he's the owner of a small dump truck that is subject to the same kinds of breakdowns. Uh, since he's a contract employee, he sets his own kinds of hours. So when he's sick or on vacation, it's difficult for us to really manage throughput. Um, so things slow down whenever he slows down. So our, our hope today uh, would be to be able to secure uh, funding to uh, allow us to uh, get a facility, a facility designated and dedicated track loader to manage uh, uh, all of the inputs and the feedstocks and do the turning, uh, do facility maintenance and load uh, the distribution trucks. And then also uh, the remaining funds for a medium duty dump truck uh, for which uh, we can distribute the compost or also uh, let uh, Green Camino use it for picking up large generator food waste, uh, spent grains and manure. Uh, this would allow us to essentially uh, increase, essentially triple our diversion rate of food waste um, from a max of about 300 tons, which is what our, which is what our facility can max out at right now uh, to about a thousand tons of food waste because with that consistent throughput and that consistent ability to be uh, constantly aerating the piles uh, and, and maintaining those hot temperatures uh, quicker uh, uh, we, we currently of course you know meet, meet all of the regulations and designations that we've set out in our registration but we can do it faster and we can make it hotter quicker uh, we just don't have the we don't have the equipment really to do so so right now, really our ask is just for support for us to uh, allow our facility to become independent and uh, really operate you know, seven days a week rather than just on the timelines of this person that we can currently subcontract. So with that, that increase, it sounds like you, you mentioned seven days a week, are you going to be hiring additional employees? Yes, we would be able to hire additional employees, um, probably a, a couple on a part-time basis, um, because I also uh, do a lot of the operating. Um, and so, yes, we would be able to hire more employees to maintain the, the turning. And curious, since I don't know where exactly your, your operations are, do you have the space at to to have more compost piles occurring? You do have the room for that growth? Yes, yes. The, so we are located northeast of Bloomington. Uh, I, our address is still listed as a Bloomington address, but we're outside of the municipal boundaries. Um, it's uh, like an eight and a half acre uh, small farm. Uh, we have a little over an acre currently designated as the compost pad, but we have another acre that we, in, that we intend to include in updating our, our IDEN registration is due for uh, uh, update next year. And so we plan on adding uh, that extra acre to it um, to help uh, manage our growth in this throughput. But currently uh, we could still squeeze probably an extra uh, 100 uh, tons of food waste composting, which would imply a few other uh, 100 tons of, of like wood chips and leaves onto the ex existing pad. We just need to be able to uh, increase our throughput pace uh, by, by being able to be turning more constantly. Any other questions from board members? I'm sorry, I just wanted to say I'm glad that you wanted to hear more about this project because I, um, even though it doesn't have, um, it's not as large scale as um, the, you know, the first few projects that we heard from, um, I feel that it's a really good grassroots effort project. So thank you. Yeah, thank I, you. I, um, you know, as I've kind of been looking through the ones that we've reviewed thus far and understanding that some of them have been uh, influenced by Terry <laughs> and willing to potentially take less, I, I'm hoping that we can maybe split some of the funds and hit some smaller projects. 
because I, I agree. I mean, we've got some really strong, large projects that could you know, use the full 500,000, but it would be nice to, to split some of them up a little bit. We have to Clark County too. Chairman. Absolutely, I do have to recuse myself from that one, so I'll turn that over to Kelly. Sure, we have somebody here representing uh, Clark County. You would state your name and then give us a brief description of your project. Uh, Chris Jackson um, with Clark County uh, Transfer and Recycling. Um, actually owned by our holding company, DC Holding Company, which um, we've been in business uh, It's Christianity Enterprise. I've uh, been with 18 years. I'm now the majority owner of the company. We employ 180 people with, um, with DC Holding. Um, we uh, do about 45 million yearly in annual revenue. We have several entity, an excavating company, a um, waste division, uh, so our waste division has grew significantly in the last 10 years in the Jeffersonville, Charlestown, um, you know, this side of the Louisville market. Um, we, we have 700 uh, roll-off and compactor boxes, and we're at lots of different uh, industrial facilities. With the new River Ridge facility, the 6,000-acre River Ridge facility, they have uh, building after building, you know, a million square foot, half million square foot. We take their waste. Um, we're the primary hauler in there, and a lot of it goes to different landfills. So we we're already invested two million in the transfer station. It's almost it's probably eighty percent constructed now. Um, our grant application is we're wanting to install a baler because we have several um, like we work with like seventy or eighty industrial customers that we have you know fifty three foot van trailers where we collect their loose sleep cardboard. And most of it gets transported to a facility in Louisville where it's recycled. If we were able to have our own compactor baler right there on our side of the river, we'd be able to offer this service to lots more of the industrial customers because we'd be able to take smaller quantities rather than have to have 53 foot van loads every week or whatever in order to justify the tolls and whatnot it takes to go to Louisville with the, with the waste. So we'll be able to separate some of the loads when they come into the transfer to go straight to the baler to be able to, you know, cardboard. And then we have customers like Sazerac, which is a, uh, they took over the military facility in New Albany. You know, we get their PET. We have all their plastic bottles that we'll be able to bail through the baler. Um, we currently move around, uh, recycle around, um, I think around 2 million uh, pounds of cardboard and PET a year currently. So we've already got a baseline we can start with to utilize our uh, baler if we're awarded this grant. Um, what's going to be great about this, we're going to be able to utilize the baler to so that we can use that as part of our marketing plan that we already have in place. We're going out to meet with these industrial customers. We have a base already, but we're expanding. We grew uh, from we grew like 400% over last year. I think our waste industry company's doing like 5 million of our 45 million in sales for our holding company. So like I said, we're a family run company. Um, I wasn't family, I've worked here 18 years. I bought in, I'm a majority owner of the company now. Um, I started buying in in 2014. Um, we've been really blessed with the, with the development of the industrial park right there next to where we're working. And we have great relationships with the municipalities, Clark County Recycling, we haul all their recyclables too. Um, so it's going to be able to take some of Clark County Recyclables, build a bail them right there in the county, and then they'll be able to sell the product instead of shipping it to out-of-state um, out state companies to be able to bail it. Um, the other thing about it is we're hauling so much loose stuff across the bridge and paying tolls and fuel and everything going farther away. If we were going straight to mills or wherever our end product would go, we were able to compact it right there close to where all the action's happening. We could do that. The other thing is, is we work with these so many construction projects and lots more of them are going to lead projects. So in the construction industry, you know, we don't put compactors there like we do in industrial facilities. They just throw it in loose. So we'll be able to bring those roll-off boxes straight to our transfer facility and bail the cardboard and put it all together and be able to give them the lead 
uh, the lead certificates in order to help uh, achieve it with the construction industry because we see so much waste. The other part of it is, is we've held, Van Christiani Excavating um, has held the um, first IBM uh, composting permit and we still hold it to this day. Um, to give you an idea on composting, we do it on a very large scale. Um, we like you know, we have an 80,000 cubic yards just on site right now that we're constantly turning. We take all the municipal um, yard waste, trees and debris. We have a, um, we reutilize it back to, uh, we compost it. Then we have a dirt operation where we collect all the topsoil and then we reutilize the um, compost mixed back in with the topsoil to have a product that we sell. We have five retail locations throughout Southern Indiana and Louisville where we sell compost, where we mix it in with the topsoil, we sell mulch and landscape products. So, um, like I said, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary this year. Um, Dan, the founder, is still very much involved, although he's out of the owning portion, but he's still there every day at 6 a.m., of course, to make sure we're doing everything right. But uh, me and his son now own the business, and it's uh, it's going really good. So, it's and to answer your question, our ask was a, our project is uh, the compactors. Um, um, we're asking for 240, uh, our, the cost machine cost 244,000 for the baler. We're asking for 122,000. Uh, we'd be willing to do the project still if we were to get $100,000 even. Um, but we, we really want to do the project, but we can't We can't really make it, the MUN numbers work um, without, without having some help on the project. Um, like I said, it, we're, we're producing 60, um, 60,000 tons of waste going to the landfill now. So the good news is we have such a good volume of waste, we can pull some of that out um, from going to the landfill is, is the good news about it. We don't know the exact percentages yet because it's, we got to market that as we go. But with it, so we know we got that 200,000 ton and that we can go ahead and start bailing. And um, right here out of Indiana, so they're all going to pull. Any questions? Did, did you submit an application last year? Yes, we did submit an application last year for a um, for a grinder for our a new grinder for our composting facility. Yeah. Um, my recollection, we we liked your application. Well, we, my memory is that we liked your application last year, but it, it boiled down to how much money. Yeah, we had. asked for the full five hundred last year, and. I know you were trying to award several smaller ones. And we asked you to reapply this year. Yeah. So my memory is. It is, and we, we do appreciate asking the talk. And I think we had a great um, application last year. And I know they asked, I know the dollar figure got cut down last year from 2 million to 1 million, which made it hard for them to award a $5 million grant. Um, and that was to do with our, like I was speaking of, our composting facility. Since we've got we've got that composting, and it's, if you were there, you would understand that there's constantly yard waste rolling into our yard. I mean, it's beautiful because they drop off the yard waste, they go up, they get a load of mulch, they get a load of topsoil, whatever it is. And then the beautiful thing now is, is our transfer facilities at the same facility. So if you bring garbage in or you bring recyclables in, you're gonna be able to dump that off, go get you a load of mulch landscape product and roll back out the gate. And so it's a big circle of, circle of life thing right there. It's gonna be nice because just like when we pull the metal out and scrap, you know, do it. It's, it's a great appreciate deal. you applying again. Yeah. Is there any other questions? Um, so the material that you're talking about bailing, mm -hmm. is it is it already um, pre-sorted material? I, I know you're talking it's pre-sorted. It pre okay, because I thought I read somewhere that um, you were talking about waste collected, here it is, waste collected from homes and businesses and, and pulling material out of that. Is okay, that well, here's, so here's an example. So like I was saying, you know, we get this new transfer facility. So, you know, we have a lot of problems with entering the landfill. Um, so that's why we built this is because we have a lot of tire issues and a lot of people, small trucks stuff going to the landfill, uh, tear up their vehicles, everything going there. So we built this new facility inside and um, they're gonna be dumping. So if somebody comes in that has uh, waste that is, and we're gonna encourage it, you know, and we're gonna work with the Clark County Recycling that they can just, they've got pure cardboard, they can just bring dust and dump it right there. And we can put it in the cardboard and go with it. So there's gonna be some of that in our transfer facility. 
And then if we get a load that is 90%, we're not gonna sit there and hand sort everything, but if we get a cardboard uh, yeah. load that's 90%, we, we're, everything's gonna be done with the excavator and bone. Okay. And we, we work with uh, Ray's Trash in Indianapolis. We've got a real good relationship with them and we're kind of mimicking off of what they're doing. And they're doing the sorting process like this. And they've helped to um, educate us and help us um, during this process of our transfer station of what they do it. And we've interviewed them, worked with them. And this was one of their big recommendations was to put a bale in and to be able to pull out those cardboard, those things we can pull with excavators and thumbs. We've got really good operators and works out really good. So we've installed a pit. Like I said, we 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 invested two million already in this new facility, but we already had an existing building, um, fifty thousand square foot building there that we that we're, uh, we're reutilizing for this project. And then your intention is to bail more than one commodity. Or... Yeah. So current so cardboard will be the primary, but we also get PET from like that Sazerac and, and some other uh, Niagara modeling. It's a big company there in River Ridge, and they for some reason have a lot of plastic uh, bottle waste. So we'll be able to take that PET. To our um, to our site and bail right there, just a couple miles away from the river facility. And you have storage areas for this material to we stage have, it. Yeah, yeah, we have multiple. If you've seen the area, you understand. We got multiple large bruises. We have multiple large, large buildings. Thank you. Huge ones. What kind of cost savings are you guys going to see by not having to take it across the river? It's 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 mainly truck time, fuel, and tolls. So. Whenever, whenever you look at the um, the actual business and and time we employ, I'm thinking a, a one and a half employee um, to operate this. It's not a huge dollar figure gain um, right now with currently what we're doing with our basically thousand tons. But the main reason we want to do it is that during our in our in our marketing program, when we got salespeople out seeing industrial customers, whenever we can. And have this in house, um, we can we can we can see this future of the recycling growing. So it's it's barely a uh, profitable business to install this thing and do it right now with our current load that we have without doing any marketing or whatnot. But but our sales have been very very uh, we're, we're pretty aggressive. So it works the way it is, but I want it to work really good, and and it, and it will. And I can't, but I can't. I can't sell it unless I have the machine of my own. I can't. And and with me having the end market for the product, you know, we're we're big on it. We need to hold and wait for the market to go up. Any other questions? Thank you very much. All right. Uh, moving on. Are there any other application? That uh, the board members would like to hear from Representative Cook. Uh, I see Mr. Caldwell back there. I'd like to hear from him. Please state your name and company. Please. Morning. My name is Jordan Caldwell of Caldwell's Incorporated. Uh, just a brief. History. My family owned the landfill in Morristown since 1970. Uh, my father worked there. I worked there. Uh, we also did recycling, cardboard, plastics. Uh, did have work one time, caught on fire. Uh, we switched directions. Uh, sold out in 2017 to advanced disposal. And uh, one of the things that I always competed against in the landfill business was composting, industrial composting. And uh, I always told my dad when we, when we sold out, I said, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do industrial composting. And uh, he questioned my sanity. And uh, but we have the farm too. So I was uh, interested in using that compost to fertilize the fields to be vertically integrated. So when we sold out, um, I went on and started my own trucking company. So I do semi hauling. I would tell you my business is 80% trucking right now. It's 10% farming. We farm about 2,000 acres, and it's about 10% composting right now. I've been in business for the composting side for one year. We did around 8,000 ton year to date from last year. Um, I spread that on my fields last winter. 
we saw a 25% increase in our yields just from the compost. The reason why is the microbial activity and the organic matter unlocked the fertilizer, the nitrogen, and allowed us, we did side by side, see what how it would act, and that's what we saw. So it's really good, it's really exciting. We are restricted on how much we can take. What I have zoned right now is 100 acres, but our pad is four acres right now. Uh, I had to buy, I'm, so I'm privately owned, sold by me. So uh, the first turner that I bought was used and it was broke and it fits on the back of one of my tractors. So we worked on it at night and on weekends, got it fixed, but our windrows are only six foot wide and three foot tall because how small the turner is. This turner would be 18 foot wide, eight feet tall. So we're looking at a capacity increase of about five times. Right now I can do about a thousand yards on the pad, at least 5,000, those are conservative numbers. Um, job increase is gonna be two to three. And the reason why is because I just got approved for a solid waste processing facility last month. So what I'm using that for is to depackage post and pre-consumed foods. One of the, the big opportunities is going into these Amazon warehouses, the Walmarts, and uh, you know I've got people on hold right now to start bringing that material in, but my problem is, is I don't have the capacity on my pet. I'm asking for $238,000 and uh, to Lou, um, I would tell you if you don't give me that, I'm gonna have to change gears. So I won't buy a new one. I won't buy one as big. It'll control my growth. And it also helps me to have something that big and be that efficient. It helps me with my price, right? Because competition. A bigger machine, bigger capacity, better price. So the people that suffer, the end users, the consumers. So that would help me keep my price down and be competitive because I'm competing against the landfill. My facility is a half a mile away from the landfill that we sold. So. May I ask what model? Um, when we're, we're over that now. It's an A55 backhoss built in Germany. I did get another uh, quote from another company, um, Comtech, and they were comparable, but I thought that backhoss was a better process. So, are you currently selling any of the compost that you're generating or just using it on the farm? Using all on the farm. And that's another thing. So, the more products that I get in, the better my end product will be. You know, right now I'm using Bungie, if I sort of Bungie, I use a lot of bean mill and batch lettuce because we are an industrial compost facility. And then I get a lot of ice cream, bulk materials. Now, when we start depackaging, you know, that's gonna help bring in the diversity. I have been working with um, some other cities, talking to them about doing collection in town, um, but I needed my depackaging facility started so, and you are going to be packaged rather than work it through a grinder, correct? That's correct. Yes, I have a. I already have two machines. I have a T thirty and a T forty, all located in Washington. You're currently registered as a land application for your compost. If you were to expand, would you anticipate getting a compost registration at all? So that's a good question. I actually had a meeting with Ida about that because that's what I wanted to do. And they they advised me not to do that because of how big and what my future looked like. Uh, I wanted to get into the industrial side. So they suggested that I go this route. It encapsulates everything. Any other questions from board members? Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other applicants that the board members would like to hear from? Hearing none, now it's time to get to the interesting part. Uh, Bruce, real quick, I think I need to um, retrieve myself from the um, DPAC. 
DTAC as well. Or, yeah, as well as uh, City of Ocean. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience, and we all appreciate your involvement, is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak at this time? Well, we do thank you all for your attendance. Um, um, we can go on the second committee where we have to go through these numbers. We have the opportunity to go into like an executive committee, or do we have to work through these numbers publicly? Publicly. Okay. Let's start with number one. We well, paid the big bucks. <laughs> I'm waiting on that paycheck. <laughs> Everybody here, we're all volunteers. Yes, I was joking. I was joking. Yes, sir. Follow up on my earlier comments, I guess, with Les's perspective, they've done a really nice job. I think our intent, if I remember correctly, uh, two or three years ago was to work towards increasing Indiana's infrastructure, primarily to compensate for what was happening uh, over in China. Now, we have some applications today that are looking to move into Indiana and increase our infrastructure. And I would hope that we could support those applications. Having said that, um, as I said before, Plastics Recycling has done an excellent job, but I have a, a problem with giving them the full $500,000 that they're asking for. So I would just suggest from my own feelings that uh, we would look at giving them $300,000 and look at that other $200,000 of supporting some of these other applications that are going to come into the state. That's just a suggestion. So I will say I've got my little abacus here of what I'm thinking in terms of numbers. I, for me, I, with the breakdown that I have, I was thinking 200000 for them would allow us to spread a little bit more. So we have a recommendation of 300 or 200,000 for Plastics Recycling Incorporated. And I'm other, not tied to that 300 either. Any other comments? For the representative of Plastic Recycling, um, would 200,000 um, work for you? Would that give you the assistance needed to move forward with your project? I think that. Um, any amount is helpful, and 200 certainly will. 300 is better, of course. <laughs> but um, if you voted as a board to grant us 200,000, we'll certainly take that and make it work. Thank you, sir. That's it. Is there any other comments from the board? The motion appropriate then. Um, motion's appropriate, and Diana, you got your little mathematic well, I will make a motion for Plastic Recycling Inc. to receive two hundred thousand dollars. There's a motion by Ms. Weger for a two hundred thousand dollars grant for Plastic Recycling Incorporated. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Aguirre. Yeah. Roll call vote. Um, Start with Ms. Weger. Aye. Mr. Guerin. Aye. Mr. H Ms. Hackman. Aye. Mr. Lutz. Um, Mr. Hughes. Uh, Ms. Whitehead. Aye. Uh, Ms. Henry. Aye. With that, uh, I'm sorry. Amy. 
I have to repeat. Oh, I'm sorry, Craig. I'm sorry. Yeah, Mr. Newman. Is that affirmative or negative? I have to that to recuse. You recuse? Yes, recuse. And I vote yes. So with that motion carries um, unanimously with two recusals. Thank you. So for Revolution Plastics Holdings, um, I, I found this project really compelling. And I know that it is rare, but I actually would like to see this one fully funded at the 500,000. And I would concur with that. An agreement because of knowing Vigo County is, is the way they can you know help Vigo County as far as from an employment standpoint. I think would be a good investment for all of them. Any other comments? Hearing that, do I have a motion? I will make a motion for Revolution Plastics Holdings to receive five hundred thousand. I have a motion by Ms. Weger for Re Revolution Plastics Holdings to receive five hundred thousand dollar grant. Do I have a second? A second. a second by Mr. Newman. Um, any comments, discussion? Hearing none, um, roll call vote. Ms. Weger? Aye. Mr. Guerin? Aye. Ms. Hackman? Aye. Mr. Lutz? Aye. Ms. Whitehead? Aye. Ms. Henry? Aye. Mr. Newman? Aye. With that, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Any recommendation from the next applicant to that clear line? Go ahead. So for this one, I was thinking. Um, Similar to, to plastics recycling, if they are able to move forward with 200,000, I think that would be a good amount. Any other comments from board members? I was thinking more of the line of 300,000. We have a recommendation of 200,000 by Ms. Weger, recommendation by 300,000 by Mr. Deeren, and representative from Ms. Uh, Clearline. He, he was the one from Canada that was on the cell phone. Oh, he was on the cell phone. I was going to say who he is. <laughs> yeah. So, with that said, um, do I have a motion on Clairline? Could I ask, uh, what did he say when he, he said asked, he was going to push for it? Yeah. I would support Kelly's at 200. It allows us to. Spread. All right. Um, is that a motion? Uh, Mr. Take a motion at 200,000. A motion by Mr. Lutz to award Clearline $200,000. And do I have a second? I'll second. Second by Ms. Weger. Just a question. Did he say that the 200,000 was taken away with that? He said he would take less. Yes, that's what I, I, I wrote it down. So if they're going to do the project anyway, they're already investing capital in Indiana. Yeah. Okay. Any additional discussion? Is there a roll call vote? Ms. Weger? Aye. Mr. Aguirre? Aye. Ms. Ackman? Aye. Mr. Lutz? Aye. Ms. Whitehead? Aye. Ms. Henry? Aye. Mr. Noonan? Aye. And I vote yes. Um, so the motion carries unanimously. Uh, clear line is awarded $200,000. Any other I have to recuse myself from the next on the list, DAK Americas. Anybody else have uh, an opinion on DAK? Oh. 
Oh. What, was, what was the response uh, on taking less from DAC? Were you able to move forward with the project if not awarded the full amount? Where that's not my complete uh, decision, I wish it was. Um, I know that we do have other operating facilities in Reading, uh, which is in the Fayette County, North Carolina, and we're also um, able to take on these. How would we allocate $300,000? How much? $300,000. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second the $300,000. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. And I have to use your cheat sheet <laughs> for the roll call. Uh, starting with myself, I will agree to that. Um, and then we have Terry. Yes. Debbie. Yes. Andrew. Yes. Uh, Craig. I can't put oh, okay. it in myself. Yes. Sandy. Yes. And Tara. Yes. Okay. So moved. Sorry, keep it up. Yep. <laughs> All right, thank you. So we have a motion passed for 300,000 uh, for DAK. Congratulations. That leaves us with $800,000. So the next uh, outcome we heard from was plus five, Indiana. Yeah. This was yeah. the pyrolysis. Yeah, we've had several over the past two or three years pyrolysis applications, and they didn't. They were funded because of the questions about each of them. This one is different because of the batch approach. And I think it would be. Um, Personally, I'd like to see them funded just to establish that technology in Indiana because I don't think we have we don't have any other paralysis projects do we in Indiana? I don't think we do. There is a one in Terre Haute, uh, Mickey Carr, uh, mainly. It's a uh, yeah, I, I don't know the status of the operation. It's, it's still in progress uh, in that term. Yeah, I also found this one interesting because of the ability to take those larger agricultural products. And I, I also would agree, I'd like to see this one funded at a higher amount. My, my opinion is I'm excited that there are no residuals and and it seems to be a pretty close loop technology. And for all the products generated, so I would be in favor. Significant from that. This would be just my question is because, in to be in like, and this is just for, for discussion, um, you know, we have, I, I kind of loop number three clear line and five in line together. Um, since we approved at 200,000 for clear line. Is this project equal to or greater than? Uh, <coughs> does it justify more or less equal to the 200k that we approved through the clear line? Just I'm just bringing that up as a balance. Yeah, I, I would say also for me, part of the picture is the, the total project cost, which this is a significantly higher total project cost. I'm having a little trouble hearing you. It's a significantly higher total project cost than the uh, clear line project. True, the, I guess, and the, the risk, but the confidence of, of getting all item approved, air and land approved. 
permitting group as well. That's still in play, or that's still. This is a smaller entity, I think, than Carolina. Is it? I think. Can I make a motion, Mr. Chairman? Move. I move that we um, fully fund the trust side. You're not going to make sure. 400,000 make math this year. <laughs> <laughs> All right. When you get to the bottom, the math is going to come harder. All right. Anyway. <laughs> All right. 400,000 is what I have. I have a motion by Mr. Guerin to award and plus five Indiana LLC $400,000. I have a second. I have a second. I have a second by Ms. Weger. And any additional discussion necessary? Hearing none, roll call vote. Ms. Weger? Aye. Mr. Guerin? Aye. Ms. Hackman? Aye. Mr. Noonan? Aye. Ms. Lutz, or Mr. Lutz, I'm sorry. I would say nay at the 400,000. And Ms. Whitehead? Aye. Ms. Henry? Aye. And I will vote aye. So the ayes have it. Um, one, two, three, four, five, seven to one. So motion carries. Thank you. The uh, Clark County application. And it suggested in last year that they reapply. They have reapplied. And uh, I think their request is acceptable uh, in my view. And I would move that we fully fund them. Um, does anybody want to second that? I guess my question, are we going down the list or can, or can we flip over to the different numbers? Did, did, did the number I think we can discuss them in any order that okay. we choose. I, I will say my, this is a challenge for, for everyone in the audience and you have wonderful applicants, lots of wonderful applicants. And we did go through a process uh, to rate each one individually and come up with a ranking system. And for me personally, even though it is a really great project and I wish we could fund all of these, it seems that it is not exactly in alignment to skip past some of the other ones that were ranked higher without having given all of them the same opportunity to discuss. And because they were ranked lower on the list, I'm personally not in favor. Even though, again, it's a great project. If we had all the money, I would absolutely say yes, but that's my opinion. My motion stands. <laughs> second. There's no second for Fair discussion. So there is no second. Is there more discussion? Are we willing to take less? That's my that's my first question. I couldn't remember if we asked that. Okay, I'll take that. Okay, I couldn't remember what that number was, so I apologize. Let's follow that. Any other discussion? Any motions? Was the motion second? No. No. Okay. So should we be discussing the motion second? I don't. Yeah, there's. So if there's no second, then we move on. So I get, well, are we at the full or the hundred? Terry had made a motion for the full. Amount. I'll do the full. I'll, I'll make the second motion for the full. Amount. Okay. Is there a cheat sheet here? Yes. So we have a motion for the full amount for Clark County and a second. So we will do a roll call. Uh, starting with myself, I am a no. Yes. Debbie? Yes. 
Craig? Yes. Sandy? Yes. Sarah? No. And Andrew? Yes. All right. So we have two no's. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you, Kelly. Moving on. Um, I believe we had the opportunity to discuss Cable Farms LLC and our discussions on Cable Farms. I would move to fund Cable Farms at 50,000. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Weaver and a second by Ms. Noonan to fund Cable Farms Indiana LLC. The full amount of fifty thousand dollars. Any discussion? Is that truck included? It is. Yeah, the truck was included, wasn't it? It was the biggest thing. It was a forty thousand. Between that and the truck loaded. Yeah. Well, we've had problems with uh, moving trucks in the past, and I still have a concern over that. I thought the primary concern in those situations was when it was an entity that could be also collecting trash and recycling because they're not in either of those businesses. It doesn't seem like a threat to me. It's a dump truck. We mm -hmm. use for a variety of things. We have the representatives from Cable Farms still on the, the wire. Yes, I am present. Sir, can you um, commit to the board that the dump truck will be used only for the purposes of recycling? Oh, absolutely. Well, I guess the question would be is the dump truck just to be used on property versus. Is, Terry, Terry that's, is that your concern? I just wanted to. Yeah, uh, we've had a problem in the past of, of vehicles that could be used for other things. And I mean, that's why uh, Sharon was asking you to commit to using it only for the intended purpose here on the property. My understanding was that it, it was not specifically solely on the property that they, they are transporting and collecting. Yeah. So for this for purpose, the purpose of the project. project. Yes. For this purpose. Yeah. So do we have your commitment that the dump truck will be used solely for the purposes of the recycling project? Yes, absolutely. Green Camino, too. So is that an issue? I don't know. Green Camino is a sister company. Will this truck be used at all for their operation? Yes, the, the intent was to share the truck such that um, large producers uh, like uh, you know the, the spent grains from our local breweries, um, manure from local stables, and then large batches of uh, uh, wasted produce from local groceries could be transported by the truck back to the facility, and then the truck you know subsequently later uh, for the compost distribution process of course would be cleaned and then loaded with uh, that compost that we deliver to farms. All right. Well, that would that would coincide with our, our goal. So thank you. Thank you. We have a motion and second on people farms. Any additional discussion? Hearing none. And Ms. Weger? Yes. Mr. Guerin? Yes. Ms. Hackman? Yes. Uh, Mr. Noonan? Yes. Mr. Lutz? Yes. Ms. Whitehead? Yes. Ms. Henry? Yes. And I vote yes. Motion carries unanimously. Congratulations. Thank you. Our team, we have $277,835 left. 227. I'm sorry, 227,000. Thank you, Greg. No worries. It just, well, so the, the comment goes into we, um, 
Mr. Caldwell came and spoke and did a very uh, eloquent job. Appreciate that. Um, the ask is over the amount that we have left by it's like 11,000. So I guess the question is, is we got, we got less than the kitty than has been asked. So um, kind of the question is, is uh, do we, you know, do we offer less to Caldwell's or do we give them the, the, the remaining left and then we're, we're um, out of funds? Right? I would ask Mr. Caldwell if you would be able to move forward with $227,835. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. I mean, has it been decided that Shelby County is you're not going to consider? Oh, no, that's right. We got to go first. I mean, I, I'm just waiting. Sure. Sorry, I jumped over. Yeah. Yeah. I think there, I heard of at least some hesitation because of. Uh, a couple of things, but you know, one of them being that they are kind of a better fit for the other grant program in some ways. Make sure. All right, uh, Mr. Lutz, would you like to make a motion? Well, actually, that's that's a good point. I don't. I mean, um, Representative Donna made a good point. Do we should we go back to the order of since uh, Lisa and Shelby both spoke first, then go down and. If there's any left to go to the next, I, I'm, I'm open to any. I mean, we can talk to Shelby County uh, first. I'll recuse myself for that one, or we can go to uh, Caldwell's. I, I'm open to either, either one, I, but I think they both spoke, so I think we got to give justice to opportunity for both discussion. So, what's the personally point? when I do the math? Uh, Lisa, are you available online? Yes, I'm here. Lisa, when I do the math on the number of cards that you have out, you currently have 5,000 cards out and you're using one packer truck five days a week, correct? That's correct. And you're requesting an additional 1,000 cards for the city's expansion and the purchase of another packer truck, correct? Correct. What will that packer truck be doing the other four days of the week? We also, the one that is in current service right now will be picking up yard waste. And with that yard waste, the recycling district pays to have that ground. And then residents of Shelbyville can pick that mulch up. So the new truck would take center lead on picking up the recycling. And your, your rolling stock is not utilized by the city or county for MSW whatsoever? No, not at all. Thank you. Thank you. What's your pleasure, board members? When we went through our normal grid scoring mechanism, uh, I guess mechanism, and uh, Shelby County did score uh, rank number six on the evaluation process. So in comparison, um, Mr. Caldwell was number eight. I'll say my, my preference is to move on to Caldwell. We have a recommendation to move on to Caldwell. Do I have a motion? I can't because I refer oh. myself on Shelby County. So I, I think that would be unfair. No, she's suggesting move on to call that right but is that a motion you're looking for a motion i'm asking for a motion i will make a motion for caldwell to receive two hundred twenty-seven thousand eight hundred thirty-five dollars. and i would second that i have a motion by Ms. wigger 
to award Caldwell Incorporated two hundred twenty-seven thousand eight hundred thirty-five dollars. And I have a second by Mr. Gira. Any additional discussion? Hearing none. Roll call vote. And Ms. Weaver. Yes. Mr. Guerin. Yes. Ms. Hackman. Yes. And Mr. Noonan. Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Lux. Yes. And Ms. Whitehead. Yes. Ms. Henry. No. And I vote yes. Motion carries. The ayes have it by seven to one. Um, with that, we've exhausted our funds available for the year. I would like to seriously thank and recommend if you were not awarded monies, please um, consider reapplying next year. It was an exciting grant round, and I commend all of the applicants. Um, I know you put a lot of hard work into this, and there are a lot of varying projects that challenge our, our, us as board members to do a very thorough evaluation. I would like to thank the staff. They always, Deanna, Julia, Pat, Tom, Everyone always does an excellent job. And I want to thank um, Representative Shadley and all of our governmental officials. And this has been an exciting year for us. And I think we are doing our best. And I commit to all of you, um, whether representatives and senators working with budget committee, that we will do our best regardless of the amount of money that you award to us to give. We would take more though. <laughs> <laughs> she kind of stole my closing <laughs> um, If there is more available, uh, we will do our best to invest that properly for a return for the state of Indiana. And I would just say Senator Yoder and Representative Arrington are on the call um, or on Zoom. So thank you to them, your colleagues as well. Yes, thank you from the board. We appreciate very much your support. Okay, with that, um, we have a few other. We have a few other. Um, on the agenda. Yes, I have to get back to my agenda. <laughs> we will try to push through, and I know that we're past our. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, next on the agenda is yes. the other, and I'll yes. turn that over. First, I, I, I apologize, but we need to go back and um, we do need a approval to uh, submit the recycling activity report to the legislator. That needs to be a roll call vote. Okay, so we need a vote to submit the recycling activity report. The recycling activity or index, report. Or index report. Um, so with that, We'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Weger? Aye. Mr. Guerin? Aye. Ms. Hackman? Aye. Uh, Mr. Noonan? Aye. Mr. Lutz? Aye. Ms. Whitehead? Aye. Ms. Henry? Aye. And I vote aye. Uh, unanim unanimously approved. And then let's go ahead and do the same for the e waste recycling report. Um, Need a vote uh, to submit the e waste recycling report. Yeah, Ms. Weger? Aye. Mr. Or Mr. Guerin? Aye. Ms. Hackman? Aye. Mr. Noonan? Aye. Mr. Lutz? Aye. Ms. Whitehead? Aye. Ms. Henry? Aye. And I vote aye. That motion carries unanimously. Our next board meeting is um, going to be a strategic planning process to, to go over that uh, Indiana recycling 
infrastructure and economic impact study and see how we can use some of those recommendations and apply some of those recommendations and how we put out our uh, RFP, our request for proposals and, and guide our grant funding in the future. Um, since we're running short on time, I, I was hoping for a little bit of discussion on that now, what you would like to see out of that session. Um, instead, let's please reach out to me and, and um, so that I can kind of guide how we're going to structure that strategic planning and how you might like to see um, or some results you might like to see out of that next meeting as well. And Deanna, I would like to make a recommendation that we reach out to other stakeholders and to have those individuals available for that meeting if they're interested and any public entity that wants to be represented. Their input uh, would be invaluable for us in, in a planning session. Thank you. Um, and um, before we get to the proposed schedule, real quick, I just also want to note for board members, I sent you all uh, information about um, reimbursement of travel um, mileage as well as per diem. So um, if you're interested in that, if you want uh, hard copy forms, uh, we have our administrative assistant, Tricia Tennis, in the back of the room. You can go see her and she can help you out with those forms. Um, they also can be submitted digitally. So reach out to me if you have any questions regarding those reimbursements. Um, $1,000 <laughs> <laughs> um, We wish. <laughs> and then um, lastly, um, I kind of changed the format of the schedule, proposed schedule for 2022. Um, I kind of worked backwards since we um, have been doing this last October session of the year um, towards the end so that we have time to get our recycling activity reports completed and finished and able to be then submitted to legislature. So I did propose to move the schedule to quarterly on the fourth Thursday of the month. I know traditionally it has been the um, first Thursday. So this is up for discussion if, if we need to move it back to that, that, that we, can, we can accommodate that. This room is available on all of those dates, whether it be the first Thursday or the last Thursday. The other thing that I wanted to bring up for our legislators is um, that first session, if they were wanting to be able to attend and possibly even the April one, um, if they have issues, would like to see it on, is there another day that might work better for you? Um, Thursday morning, you're in session. Thursday mornings, you're in session. Okay, um, what day of the week is better? Tuesdays would be afternoon. Tuesdays are Tuesday mornings should be better. Tuesday mornings. Is there anybody on the Zoom call that has uh, issues with maybe possibly moving at least that first? Would we need to move the first and the second of the session? What's, what's, what April 28th. I know that's right at the end of the first should be finished. Okay. On the short session. Okay. It's the short. <laughs> um, we want to move Thursday. Thank you. January 25th work, Representative. Oh. <laughs> or, or maybe Senator Yoder or, Yoder or Representative Arrington yeah. would um, January 25th in the morning work for you. I'm looking at the screen again. As, as far as I know, it would work for me. I think so. It's hard to know since I haven't received the, the calendar, but if it is the same as last year, then it should be okay. Is That's a Thursday or a Tuesday? Tuesday. We, we're, we're suggesting moving the, the first meeting to Tuesday, January 25th. I, that would be better because on the Thursday, the house meets in the morning, but we meet in the afternoon on Tuesdays. <laughs> we can, we'd appreciate all our board members being at the the maybe the following week. Yeah, that's what I was trying to prior the 18th, January 18th. 
teaching that day as well. Are you available on Tuesday in January? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Let's find out together. Oh, well, that's January 18th. That's not Martin Luther King. January 17th is Martin Luther King, right? Where is that? Okay. Um, yes. January 11th, Tuesday, or February 1st. <laughs> I'm as surprised as you are that I'm already booked out that far. <laughs> Would would the uh, legislators have a preference between January 11th or February 1st? I would probably suspect it's both the same. Okay. Possibly January 11th because it's earlier in the session. There would be less going on. Right. And uh, look. I'm not sure what the work date is on the bills. Okay. So January 11th. January 11th, it sounds like for the first meeting of the session or meeting of the board. I will not be in attendance for that. I have a conference to be at in Indianapolis that morning. <laughs> it's amazing. We try to do this in plenty of time in advance, and we are scheduled out months in advance, aren't we? <laughs> Um, that's, that's when we have our legislative breakfast for the soil and water districts. February 1st? Yeah, February 1st. No, February. I think it's the January 1st. Wait a minute. <laughs> no, no, no. We're going to celebrate. <laughs> February 1st. Board members, are we, as far as we know, available? <laughs> Possible. Possible, yeah. <laughs> It sounds like we will shoot for February 1st at this time. And all the other dates for the year, I know that those are well in advance, so hopefully those will be okay. And if not, we can adjust them. Yes, the we day. can still adjust those at the next meeting. Those are my final notes for other. I just think it's imperative that we have the legislators here and involved as much as possible. Yeah. All right, it's been a long meeting. Um, board members, thank you so very much for the effort and time you, you spent reviewing the applications, going through the scoring process. Um, this has been a great round because we had a lot of new board members and we certainly appreciate all of your input. Kelly, I'd like to thank you for taking over the one I can um, voice an opinion on any applicant. Those of you in the gallery, thank you very much for your attendance. And again, if you were not awarded, please do not hesitate to reapply. As always, the biggest thanks. And happy birthday in advance to Pat. <laughs> Biggest thanks to staff. And we have to give a strawberry cake. Yeah. Those of you who have recused themselves today at the meeting, make sure to see um, Michael over there in the corner as well. And, and I want to also uh, send my thanks out to the board. We had every board member score in the grant. And, and it's a fabulous effort. I know it takes time and energy, and I really appreciate it. Um, Things you guys do for this board. We owe you a special thanks, Diana. You're the leader, and we appreciate everything that you put forth. So, thank you so very much. Um, in closing, we need a motion to adjourn. Motion by Mr. Lutz. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Guerin. Um, because Ms. Henry's on the, the speaker, I guess we still have to do a roll call vote. Um, Ms. Weger. Aye. Mr. Guerin. Aye. Mr. Noonan. Aye. Ms. Hackman. Aye. Mr. Lutz. Aye. Ms. Whitehead. Aye. And I vote aye. So motion carries unanimously. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That will teach you, Terry. You need to come to the meeting. Uh, Ms. Henry. Let me think about this. I. <laughs> really comfortable. comfortable. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> Um, so now the motion carries you, you know, so I have a safe drive home. Thank you very much. <laughs>